right, so the recorder is live, and as I said, when the recorder's off, I'm gonna take a couple minutes to read a statement so you know what I'm saying about you. So today is Friday, October 13th, 2017. My name is Philip Scarpino, professor of history at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, IUPUI, and director of oral history for the Tobias Center for Leadership Excellence, also at IUPUI. I'm interviewing Dr. Robert Lord at the Square Brussels Meeting Center, Brussels, Belgium, which is the headquarters for the annual meeting of the International Leadership Association. This interview was a joint venture undertaken by the Tobias Center and the International Leadership Association. We'll include a more detailed biographical summary with the transcript of this interview, but for now, I'll provide an abbreviated overview of Dr. Lord's distinguished career. He earned his PhD in psychology at Carnegie Mellon University in 1975, writing a dissertation titled Group Performance as a Function of Leadership Behavior and uh, Task Structure. Dr. Lord was employed by the University of Akron from 1974 through 2012 rising through the academic ranks from assistant to associate to full professor, holding the rank of distinguished professor from 2004 to 2012. Dr. Lord played a key role in developing the University of Akron's graduate industrial organizational psychology program, ranked in the top 10 in the United States in 2009 by US News and World Report. In 2013, Dr. Lord joined the faculty of Durham University in the United Kingdom, where he is employed as professor of management, Durham Business School, and director, International Center for Leadership and Followership. Dr. Lord's colleagues who helped me understand his career described him as a thought leader, a brilliant and productive scholar who combines wide-ranging interests with the ability to stay grounded and focused on research problems. They also described him as student-oriented and a gifted and generous mentor, and they really like you. <laughs> and by the way, you have some real fans. Uh, Robert Lord has an amazingly productive career as a published scholar, including three co-authored or co-edited books and about 144 refereed journal articles of book chapters published between 1976 and 2017. About 59 of his articles and chapters are first author publications. His Google Scholar Citation Index shows 21,626 lifetime citations with just over 9,800 since 2012. His most cited publication with 1,862 citations is Leadership and Information Processing, Linking Perceptions and Performance, co-authored with Karen Mayer, M-A-H-E-R, who earned her PhD under his direction in 1991. He has played a major role in training and mentoring the next generation of scholars in his areas of expertise, including leadership, having served as major advisor for 40 dissertation students and as a committee member for an additional 49 dissertations. Dr. Lord has earned numerous awards and recognitions, including but not limited to Best Paper of the Year Award by Leadership Quarterly for 2015 and Distinguished Scientific Contribution Award Society of Industrial and Organizational Psychology for 2012, the Distinguished Scientific Contribution Award is a national award intended to recognize a scholar who has made the most distinguished empirical and or theoretical scientific contributions to the field of industrial and organizational psychology. The recognition that brings us here today is the International Leadership Association's Lifetime Achievement Award. So I want to ask your permission to do the following, to record this interview, to transcribe the interview, to deposit the recording and the transcription in the IUPUI Special Collections and Archives where they may be used by patrons including posting oral or part of the recording and the transcription to the website of the IEPY Special Collections and Archives, and also to deposit the recording and transcription with the International Leadership Association and the Tobias Center, where they may be used by patrons with the understanding that all or part may be posted to these organizations' websites. So can I have your permission to do those yeah, things? Yeah, sure, that's fine with me. Okay. I mean, the big thing is to understand that this is not anonymous, that your name is going yeah, to be associated sure, with this. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Okay. So again, as I mentioned when the recorder's off, I'm going to start uh, by explaining, for the sake of anyone using this interview, that I'm going to start by asking you some big picture questions in order to get the conversation going. And after that, uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions about your childhood to get some demographic information on the record. And then I'll follow those questions by asking you about your youth and young adulthood, um, education aimed at uh, providing insight into the big picture question of who, who are you, who is Robert Lord. And when we're done with the questions about your youth and adulthood, or young adulthood, we're going to work our way more or less chronologically through your career with plenty of discussion about leadership. So um, okay. that's where we're going. And okay. uh, so first question, and just, just to throw it out on the table, what drew you, to, what, what provided the interest in studying leaders and leadership? Where did that come from? You know, that, that's a really good question. Uh, <laughs> I think... Probably around 1972 or something like that when I was in graduate school, I took a course in uh, small group behavior. And uh, 
in part of what we uh, examined there was uh, leadership, and it kind of grew out of that. Uh, I started looking at leadership functions, and, and that's sort of more like, what is it that people do to make groups effective? And it was kind of a, a shared leadership approach so that we would code leadership functions in, uh, from all members of, of small groups. And so that's really uh, more like uh, group psychology and, and trying to understand task performance. And it comes really from, uh, I guess conceptually from work done by Bales and in coding interactions. And in, uh, in the like 1950s, he developed an interaction coding system and uh, it dealt more with what I'd call surface structures or kinds of statements mm -hmm. and functional behaviors dealt more with what the behaviors were attempting to accomplish in terms of moving groups towards their mm -hmm. goals and managing social processes. So, so that was my focus uh, through my dissertation and leadership was um, an outcome uh, as, as well as you know, group performance being an outcome that we tried to explain. Who, who taught that class that led to Lit the fire. <laughs> uh, well, I think it was more like a seminar. Oh. There, were, there were several faculty that were in the class. Uh, and my memory's a little hazy, but I think for sure I know Joel Goldstein mm -hmm. was there, and uh, I think Hans Pennings, mm -hmm. and uh, might have been uh, Terry Gleason was there as well, but I don't know. Carnegie Mellon was kind of a interesting place because they didn't really te treat graduate students all that much different than faculty. You know, once you were there, you were a colleague. I mean, if you were in a seminar with three distinguished faculty members, that's a yeah. pretty good. Um, so you mentioned coding functions. Yeah. What, what, what kinds of functions? And could you briefly explain for people who are not in your discipline what you're doing when you're coding? Sure. Uh, <laughs> Well, um, to be honest, I don't, don't remember all the categories. I'd have to look at it. But, Just a few examples. But you know, one would be uh, problem definition, mm -hmm. okay? And so for there, we found kind of an interesting thing. You'd expect people to start out defining problems the first thing in groups, and some did. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you get a lot of those comments in the middle or near the end and they'd be symptomatic of poor performance. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's an important point because uh, when you code behaviors and try and use them to predict outcomes, usually you just count the behaviors and assume right. the more the better, and sometimes the more the worse. Right. You know, so, uh, so that, that would be one. Uh, but in this case, timing of the behavior was important, not just whether or not they did yes, it. Yes. And, and, uh, I guess I wasn't that sophisticated. I, I just counted and <laughs> did, did regressions to predict dependent variables. But uh, so other behaviors might be asking for information or uh, supporting people, sort of communication behaviors, uh, things like that. One of the things that we should have put in there, but we didn't, was like uh, uh, setting goals and giving feedback on, on goal attainment. I think we all go back and look at our first research project, so wish we could do it over. Well, but. yeah, sure, um, because it was the early 70s, okay. and uh, about the same time, a little bit earlier, Ed Locke was doing stuff on goal setting, but it wasn't as widely recognized as it is now. So when you're talking about coding and the time period that you were involved in this, that's with punch cards and a mainframe computer? Well, we had a, a form and we would check behaviors in certain categories as we watched the uh -huh. group and we would videotape it and then go back and uh, uh, look at any problems. But it was not really all that sophisticated. Later on, you know, we got really tricky after I went to the University of Akron and we'd do split screens. Mm -hmm. So we'd have one of the group and one of what they were doing. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 but that's as sophisticated as we got. Nowadays you'd do it a whole lot differently. 
So you mentioned Bales as yeah. Uh, could you give a full name on it on him, please? I assume it's him. I think it's Robert Bales. He, okay. I think he was a, a professor at Harvard. Okay. So you spent much of your adult life conducting research on leaders and leadership and writing and publishing on these topics and teaching classes, at least I listed on your CV. So in order to provide a, a bit of a window into your thinking, how do you define leadership? How do we know it when we see it? Oh, um, a lot of people have trouble with that. I, I don't. <laughs> I just think of it as a perceptual process that results in increased influence for the person being perceived and moves a group towards mm -hmm. its common goals. So, in 2012, I had the opportunity to interview Edgar Schein, um, uh -huh. who was also a recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award. And he is quoted in numerous places as saying, the only real thing of importance that leaders do is to create and manage culture. And by culture, he meant uh, organizational culture. So if I were to give you his, his statement, um, based on all your experience studying organizations and leadership, and I were, if I were to say, the only, real, the only thing of real importance that leaders do is, how would you fill in the blank? What, what, what do leaders do that matters? You can answer that question at lots of levels, okay? And Let, let's go from the simple to the uh, complex. Okay, we well, well let's, start, let's, let's start off where, where we were. Uh, Shine has a, has a good point, and I would extend it to say one of the things that leaders do is they create structures. They create social structures. Culture can be one of them. Uh, uh, I mean, that's an aggregate structure. It, they may also activate uh, identities and followers. So that's more of an individual level structure. But they create or activate structures that then have effects in structuring group behavior or organizational behavior. And just to, to show you that I'm a, a fan of Shine, um, in 2008 and 2009, uh, I was working with Sean Hanna and a number of other psychologists. And we, he was at West Point, and uh, the a Center for uh, Developing the Behavioral Ethics of, of the Military. And uh, General Petraeus, who's yeah. here this time, asked us to survey the troops in Iraq, which we did. And uh, it took a while, and, and uh, I won't get into the nuts and bolts of it, but one of the things that we looked at as a dependent variable was abusive behavior of non-combatants. And what we essentially found was that leaders created ethical cultures, okay? That's, that's that, that word, again. And cultures affected abusive behavior. So in a sense, it's just supporting shine. And we, we looked at this at multiple levels, at a, uh, a company level, a platoon level, and a squad level. So we looked at leadership at all three of those levels and culture at all three of those levels. And this article is um, published in uh, Academy of Management Journal in 2012. And so what we found is that uh, ethical leadership behaviors cascades down levels and it has a horizontal effect on culture, but culture was the big mediator in terms of affecting uh, uh, abusive behavior as an outcome. So Shine's right in the sense that that is one thing that leaders do, but that's at one level. They, they do the same thing in terms of of group identities, creating a group identity. They do the same thing in terms of um, individual identities. But we wouldn't call it culture, we just, it's another kind of structure. So I would say, I would broaden his statement and say that what, uh, what leaders often do is they create structures, and those structures have an effect. And uh, in a study that I did with Dave Day, who I think you've probably talked to, yes, I did talk to you. Uh, 
we, we sort of discovered that um, the leadership effects lag uh, the appointment of a leader. Uh, and so at top levels, it may lag two or three years. So uh, part of the reason for that is that it takes time to create structures and create strategies, and then those things have a effects that are independent of leaders. So I'm going to follow up on Iraq, and then I'm going to follow up on some of the other things that you said. But So I assume that you did these studies of company, platoon, and squad in the United States? No, 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 went to no, Iraq. no, no, we didn't go to Iraq. Okay. Um, this data, we, we developed the instruments and uh, the army chaplains collected the data for us. And by abusive behavior, you mean of civilians? Of uh, non-combatants, yeah. it could be civilians, could be people that were uh, detained for one reason or another, yeah. So you talked about leaders creating social structures and activating identity and uh, group and individual identity. Do effective leaders understand that they're doing those things or does it just happen? I mean, you uh, see uh, it because uh, you're uh, coding. Yeah, it, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Well, first of all, um, they may not understand it because some structures just emerge. And so, I mean, you always, in leadership, you have the interplay of top-down effects and bottom-up effects. And so in a typical person-focused leadership, we tend to think of the leader has these qualities and they make good decisions and they percolate down, as that example with uh, ethical military leadership illustrates. But leaders also create climates or or a sense of empowerment that allows people to interact in certain ways and their interactions create structures. So you have bottom-up structures that develop in ways that aren't necessarily understood or anticipated. And uh, complexity theory mm -hmm. is a theory that deals with how social processes operate that way. And, uh, like you'll see occasionally, like in, in the program, I forget who, but somebody has an article of like, what can we learn from ants and fish? Well, ants develop bottom-up sort of social structures and very complicated structures, and fish do too. So you, every time you see a structure doesn't mean that you have a central leader directing it. Mm -hmm. Does that make any difference? when you, one of the variables is the kind of organization, military being fairly rigid, hierarchical, other organizations say not-for-profit being completely different in terms of the bottom-up and top-down? Uh, sure, uh, but you also have to think of, well, the military has very clear structure, has clear goals and clear ethical standards, but if you think of okay, what happens in actual combat situation? It's chaos. Right. And so there they give leaders a lot of discretion to utilize uh, the resources of, of their platoon or company and to make their own decisions uh, as long as it's consistent with what they call command intent. Mm -hmm. It's okay. So when you talk about creating social structures, activating identities, group and individual identity. How would that influence leadership education? Or how would, does that, do those things influence the way you teach leadership? Well, I try and teach people about the processes. Mm -hmm. uh, when I teach leadership, I try and get away from entity viewpoints. Uh, you know, leaders have certain traits that allow them to be effective and talk in terms of processes and what's going on in terms of perceptual processes, information processes, uh, uh, social processes, and, and then also the structural things that affect outcomes. And the, the other area that I study a lot is uh, motivation. And so you can also think of leaders affecting the self-regulatory processes in followers. And um, that has a really important effect. 
So when you when you talk about motivation, you're talking about the the ability of a leader to motivate followers, or the leader's motivation. No, the ability to motivate followers in certain ways, mm -hmm. and um, so. We've known for a long time that in the leadership field, uh, there's a tendency to take common sense ideas about what leadership is and what leaders do and build theories around them where a, a deeper understanding could use scientific-based mm -hmm. constructs. And uh, that idea comes from a really interesting article, it's a book chapter by a, by a person named Calder and it's in a book edited by Barry Stoff. Yeah. And um, so an example of that is that if you think about motivation from a motivational process, we have a big difference in terms of whether you activate two kinds of system. One's a promotion system and one's a prevention system. And a promotion system has to do with um, trying to achieve good outcomes, things that are attractive, uh, operating in a world that's relatively safe, and it's really a left frontal hemisphere type of a system. And a prevention system is avoiding harm, uh, not making errors, uh, correcting errors when they occur. That's a right hemisphere system, and it's, it's also a little bit more spatial. Uh, and the left is more uh, symbolic and linguistic. So leaders can activate those different kinds of motivational systems and in the process change the way followers go about doing what they're motivated to do. You can approach the same goal, but the underlying way that you think about it could be quite different. Do good leaders move from one of those scenarios to the other, depending on the situation? Uh, they probably do. Yeah. Uh, whether they know that they're doing that and think of these kinds of systems, I don't know, or whether they just kind of build skills over time. Uh, so, a, a new question. James McGregor Burns published his seminal work on called Leadership in 1978, just a few years after you earned your PhD. Um, did you know Burns, by the way? Should no. I, should no. I ask you that? Okay. No. Um, so he, he said the following on page two of that book. He said, there is, in short, no school of leadership, intellectual or practical. Does it matter, he asked, that we lack standards for assessing past, present, and potential leaders? So the question I want to ask you, because you've been doing this for a long time, is do you agree or disagree with Byrne's statement that in the late 1970s we lacked standards for assessing the past, present, and potential leaders? It's probably right. Um, because you were sort of clearly working in that area. And, sure, And yeah. that Just, your, your field was working in that area. Yeah. Um, so what, what would cause you to think that he was right? I mean, well, first of all, I mean, it, it's in, in some ways it's a it's an oversimplification because you say standards in what domain? You know, leadership in one domain is not the same as in another domain. Uh, I think leaders acquire what we what I'd call domain-specific skills. And uh, I have an article with uh, Rosalie Hall in 2005 where we talk about that in depth. And uh, Rosalie Hall, just for the records, is uh, my spouse. And we've been... I found that out after I emailed her. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I didn't know it at the time. <laughs> yeah, so, so we've been doing stuff together since... before we were married, since the early 90s. Um, but in that particular article, we took information... we took the literature on skill development and tried to apply it to leadership. And... Um, but what you see, even before that, is that... Uh, when you ask people to define leadership, they'll define it differently in different contexts. And so our argument would be that the skills, as the literature on uh, uh, skill development shows, are domain specific. 
So if you're a good pianist, that doesn't mean you're a good chef. Right. Um, and if you're a good astronaut, that doesn't mean you could become the CEO of Eastern Airlines right. and uh, do a good job. Uh, so uh, it, it also suggests that if you want to select good leaders, you have to take account. Sorry, Robert. You have to take account of the domain. And then by domain, you mean context. Yeah, the context, yeah. the yeah. Leader, leaders mm -hmm. in what area. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is something that's always kind of puzzled me. And uh, I'll, I'll preface this by saying, so I come from an industrial organizational psychology program, and we teach uh, industrial organizational psychology, uh, at, at least at Carnegie at uh, University of Akron, broadly. So if you were building a selection test for a particular area, you have to do uh, a job analysis, a task analysis, to see what the job requires, to see what the tasks are and what skills they require, and then you have to build a battery based on that particular situation. Well, we should be doing the same thing in leadership. If leadership is important enough that we pay leaders all this money, mm -hmm. we ought to be willing to invest some money in analyzing the job and figuring out the skills required. Right. But we don't do that. Instead, we, th we think of leadership not as a skill, but as a quality of the person. And so we look for general traits that might predict uh, leadership, and I think that's a mistake. We ought to ask, well, what do we want leaders to be effective at? What are the skills that, we, that they need to have in those situations? And then select on that basis. So I'm going to come back to the literature in the field in a few minutes, but, but given all the social science literature that exists on, on uh, leadership, do you find that to be a little bit surprising? That much of this is still done by the sort of figurative seat of the pants? Uh, it's surprising and discouraging. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is a, it's, it's a nice organization, but if you sort of thumb through the papers being presented, a lot of them are done by students or people early in their career, and it's as if they took what they were interested in, applied, put the label leadership with it and then started looking at it. So it's, it's common sense mm -hmm. uh, ideas about leadership. And of course, there's a basis for common sense ideas about leadership because we all interact with leaders and, uh, and so we build some understanding of what's going on and some sense making. But it's not necessarily uh, the best basis for building a scientific theory about what leadership is how it has outcomes, uh, what leaders should be doing. So we'll, again, in, in a few minutes, talk more about your series of leadership, but you do talk about the process of leadership and the interplay between the leader and the, what we now call, call the follower. Sure. So when we look at that process and you look at it from the point of view of somebody who's maybe not a social scientist, just wants to understand leadership. How does one blend science and common sense? I mean, where, where, do, where, where does each of those fit into the understanding or the functioning of leadership? Okay, um, a really good question. I think you have to separate <clears throat> a couple things. One is leadership's a perceptual process. So it's, a, a, it's an interpersonal process where we see other people behave and we try and form some assessment of the person. And we do that using the linguistic structures and schemas that we have for making sense of other people. Mm -hmm. they, and we may not always use leadership as a basis for understanding other people. Uh, but that's another issue. But so it, there's a strong perceptual component and it's understood in terms of uh, social cognitive processes associated with perceptions, emotional processes, mm -hmm. uh, embodied processes. And, um, and then there's an effect of leaders on performance. Okay, well, there can be direct effects of leaders on performance, and some can be highly visible. Um, 
I remember watching a football game when Mike Ditka was a football coach and somebody made a mistake and they pulls him off the field and he yells at them on the sidelines. Right. Okay, you know, you'd say, okay, that's leadership. You can see it and you can observe it. But the kind of, of effects that we started talking about, like leadership occurring through uh, structures and developing cultures, mm -hmm. and those effects may be occurring a year, two years down the road. Well, it's hard to understand causality in, mm -hmm. in those terms. So people substitute perceptual processes. So Jim Mindel, who is deceased but is also getting an award, mm -hmm. uh, Jim's big contribution was to emphasize that process and argue that leadership is socially constructed and that people have romantic ideas as to what leaders are, sort of like the, the, the John Wayne model of leadership. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, and so that might be a type of intuitive, common sense understanding that's popular, but it misses the really important processes that produce excellent performance in a way that can be sustained on an individual level or on an organizational level. So as a social scientist, when you, you do your research, but if in any way you're trying to influence the process of leadership, you're constantly arm wrestling with cultural perceptions. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know. How so, do you win? <laughs> well, sometimes you don't. Yeah. You know. Uh, um, and and you have to be have to be honest. It's like I am more of a social scientist and researcher than a practitioner. Mm -hmm. um, but I, but of course. I've been a department head, so uh, so you're you're in some ways a leader then, and I'm the director of a leadership center, and that seems to be effective. But um, I really you teach MBA students, or yeah, yeah, I do I do do that too. Uh, so uh, you have some effects, but um, uh, I think they're indirect. Uh, I'm good at. Uh, getting people to help me because there's so many areas that I need help in, you know, <laughs> and they're willing to do it because they're so much better than me at that. Huh. You mean to help you with your research? Yeah, or, or yeah. Just, just anything. I'm, yeah. I'm not, uh, not as organized as you might think, and uh, it's getting worse as I get older. So, Let myself let my let my head get out of these questions here. Sure, um, that's fine. Since 1978, when Burns' book came out, okay, which, which I would say still remains a seminal work in the field. Although, uh, yeah, I'd say that. Yeah, a little bit like reading scripture, though, because anything you want is in there. I mean, it's, there's so so much packed in there. That, yeah, absolutely. Um, but so since 78, and especially in the past several decades, the schools and programs of leadership of absolutely proliferated and so has the, the literature, literature on leadership and leadership studies. So the question that I have is given the proliferation of leadership studies and literature, have we in the present developed standards for assessing past, present, potential leaders? In other words, have we developed the, the ability to do what Burns said we didn't, couldn't do in 1978? Oh, well, sure. Some organizations have, the military does a really good job at that, and they have for a, a number of years of both assessing and training uh, in uh, uh, organizations do that. They have a lot of leadership development activities. So uh, first of all, to get back to the selection uh, point that I talked about, mm -hmm. there's two ways you can approach uh, finding people that have the skills to do a job. One is you can select certain people that have those skills, and the other is you can train them. Mm -hmm. And uh, while selection may be a problem, there is a phenomenal industry on leadership training. And so the argument there is really that you can uh, develop skills in people. Does leadership training work? Can you really train somebody to be a leader? Uh, I mean, I, I think for a minute that, that, that I'll, I'll go, I'll give you a chance to think of, 
you know, I could, with all my heart, I could want to slam dunk a basketball, and I could never do it because mm -hmm. I'm not tall enough. I don't have the jumping ability. There's no one who could train me to do that. Um, I could watch movies. I could fantasize, but I could never do it. So is, is there any element of leadership that is like that, or can we actually train people to be leaders? Are they born or made? <laughs> I think they're, well, there's just both is, is the obvious answer. There's a lot of literature on um, identical twins and uh, evolutionary basis for leadership that suggests that there are some inherited characteristics that predispose you towards being successful leaders. But um, training is a funny term. And most people who have been in the field a, a while look at it more as experience. And so leadership training in the long run is often setting up uh, a series of situations where people can gain experience as leaders. So that's why a lot of leadership training programs are multi-week programs. They might run one or two or three semesters. And we're getting studies that look at the um, time course or trajectory of learning leadership skills. Uh, the problem with that is that skills are, outcomes of training are often associated with the way people are perceived by others uh, and sometimes self-perceptions. And so uh, what, what you tend to, to see is that as somebody gets into a leadership training program, their leadership ratings go down. And I think it's like a, a, a shift in standards. It, and, and then they come up. But what um, is central to the process is that people seem to develop an identity of themselves as being a potential leader. And then uh, around that identity, they organize various kinds of skills. So that as someone is experienced and sees themselves as a leader, they can do uh, many things automatically. And so in the article that I mentioned with uh, uh, Rosalie Hall, what we argue is that <clears throat> you go through novice to intermediate to expert stages in terms of developing skills. And uh, to just flesh that out a bit, a novice might be concerned with surface structures in, in terms of behaving as a leader. So they're very focused on what they're doing and how that's being evaluated by other people. But as they learned ways to behave, then they have more capacity that's free to self-monitor and to uh, see how other people are reacting and to think what other people's needs are. And so uh, they become less self-centered and more other-centered. And then as they become experts, they have more principled knowledge, and, they begin, and they're able to think in terms of uh, bigger systems. <clears throat> so like I was talking to uh, a colonel in the military, and I've forgotten his name, that he was telling me, oh, it really wasn't until about 15 or 20 years into his career as a military officer that he really understood how a battalion functioned. Okay. The military is almost a case study of what you were just saying. Though. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, you you need uh, you need to be able to have a certain set of skills and be able to manage what you're doing, so that you can then focus on understanding the way other people are reacting to you and what their needs are and how you can help them do what they need to do. And then you have to be able to understand how they do it within the particular system. Because sometimes it's not the person. Sometimes it's the system that has to be changed to allow the person to do what they're capable of doing. So an organization that has a goal of developing effective leaders, do they need to self-consciously foster that kind of uh, scenario that you just talked about, novice progressing on up the line to, to expert? I mean, did, should, do they have to know be aware of that process and nurture leaders along that path, or does it just happen? I don't know. <laughs> I, mean, I think it would be helpful if they were aware of it. Yeah. 
I think it, it probably happens even uh -huh. though that they, they aren't. Uh, but um, it's also the case, I think, that early on people learn to manage their image in organizations and the way they're perceived by other people. And that's not necessarily what's going to make groups effective or organizations effective. So people have to get beyond that. And, and some people don't. They're mm -hmm. just interested in managing their career and moving up. And, uh, and some people do. They're really interested in uh, making other people function better and uh, making organizations work. So how should we go about assessing the effectiveness of leaders? How do we know if they're doing a good job? Well, it, it, first of all, it depends at the level that the leader's okay. on at. Okay. Whether um, at, at sort of entry level uh, or lower level leadership where you're mainly responsible for maybe a work team, that assessment was going to have to occur at that work team level. Okay. and. At, at intermediate levels, you might be responsible for a much bigger work unit, and then you have, you know, like your top management team and the way they perceive you, but also the effects of the structures that you develop. And sometimes those effects are lagged mm -hmm. um, to where they occur after the leader's no longer there. So, uh, in a national level, um, I think Trump is benefiting a lot from what Obama did. And it's not going to be for till a year or two years into his presidency that we're really going to see the Trump effect. Mm -hmm. And um, that's hard for people to recognize. It's hard for people to assess. Um, so, and, and again, it depends on where you are. If you're talking about higher levels and precedents, it's a whole lot mm -hmm. different than if you're talking about higher levels and uh, uh, mm -hmm. religious leaders or technology leaders or something like that, uh, or business leaders. Uh, so uh, assessing effectiveness is situational, it depends absolutely. on what the person is doing. And so let's, a political leader at the national level, how, how do we measure success? And I'm not asking you to go after Trump. I mean, I'm oh, yeah, just sure, sure, I'm yeah. specific. Um, well, that's a really good question. Um, politics is partly about perceptions. And so the way they're perceived is one measure of success. And then their ability to exercise influence is another uh, measure of success. And their ability to get things done is a third one. Uh, see, I, I tend to think of, um, so if you, if you take the period when, you're probably old enough to remember it, when uh, Kennedy was president and then oh, Lyndon, yes. <laughs> Lyndon Johnson was president, um, Johnson was so good at uh, getting things to happen working through Congress. And then I think he had Hubert Humphrey in Congress at the time who was very effective at getting things done. But something like the uh, civil rights le legislation yeah. and the Voting Rights Act, that didn't happen like that. That took months and months and months to get that through Congress. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but that's an effect that had a really long shadow in terms right. of how it changed things for the rest of the country mm -hmm. and, and for uh, just various ideas as to what society should be like and what opportunity mm -hmm. should be like. Um, so, I mean, that was effective leadership. But then the Vietnam War was probably not effective leadership. Uh, and and I, <laughs> I just, let's, deal, let's not deal with that one right now. It's just an example. Yeah. No, I, I understand. Um, so I, I mentioned, and you're well aware of the fact that since 1978, there's a 
massive body of leadership related scholarship. Um, scholarship that's come from a number of disciplines. Some of the work is narrative and qualitative. Uh, you know, McGregor Burns falls into that category. Um, some of it's highly quantitative. Um, I had an opportunity to interview Fred Fiedler at one point where he was undertaking sort of pathbreaking research at the University of Illinois association with a group effective research laboratory. Um, your own work, I, I guess I would put in a quantitative approach. So the question I have is, given all that huge body of literature, mm -hmm. what does it all add up to? And I'm, I'm not assuming that you've read everything in print, but I mean, you're yeah, that, widely read and... Yeah. Uh, Well, I think what it uh, adds up to is it means that there's some aspects of leadership that we have a pretty good grasp on and some aspects that we're still struggling to develop a good theory of. Um, and I, I, mean, I can elaborate if... Yes, what, let's, let's start with the aspects that, that, we, that you, you put in the category of good that we, that we know. Well, I think we know a lot about... Um, leadership perceptions. Mm -hmm. uh, we know about that because we can draw on lots and lots of non-leadership research that I'd put in the social cognitive category. So we know how social perceptions work in general from work mm -hmm. that social psychologists do, and we know how cognitive processes function. We know mm -hmm. about uh, embodied aspect of perception. So. For example, uh, transformational leaders are thought to, to have visions and inspire people's mm -hmm. uh, activities, but transformational leaders also convey positive emotions. And so if they smile and other people smile in, in, mim in terms of facial mimicry, then that changes the moods of the people who are responding to that leader, and they will see them as being more transformational. So uh, perceptions are both physical and cognitive reactions of people in making sense of others. And uh, we know a lot about the cognitions, we know a lot about uh, the social dynamics and, and the embodied aspects. And so if we were to say, can you train somebody to be perceived as a leader? Yeah, you could do that. Uh, I, I don't think it's just gestures or embodied processes the way Cuddy talks about it, but um, in terms of voice qualities, uh, posture, uh, confidence, uh, the ability to uh, be salient, mm -hmm. Uh, we could train people to do that. Um, so salience is an important part of perceptions, and uh, I, th I think Trump understands it, but Ronald Reagan certainly understood it too. And so when, when Reagan, as president, before he would go uh, do a talk, he would have his advanced people go out and say, where are the cameras going to be? Where's my mark where I'm supposed to stand so I'm salient? Mm -hmm. And salience has an effect on leadership perceptions. <laughs> Causal attributions have an effect on leadership perceptions. But we know about that stuff from work done in the 70s and 80s and, and 90s. How leaders affect performance is much more difficult because uh, think of the issue. Perceptions, we're always dealing with a person who's a perceiver and sometimes perceptions of aggregates of people, mm -hmm. like maybe a group. But performance, we could be dealing with things at the level of an event, at the level of a person, at the level of a group, small group, or at the level of an organization, or even national uh, economic markets and how they perform. So that is a much more difficult area. And as you move up from events to markets, then the time frame of effects increases. 
So if we're dealing with an event like a hurricane, we might evaluate leadership in terms of what somebody does in a, a, a day or a week or something like that, or maybe a month. But we're talking about how you change markets, like uh, the state of New York is trying to restructure the way the electric markets work. And that takes years. So uh, understanding performance in that scope is, is much more complex because of the level factor and the time factor. So as a social scientist studying leadership, is it easier to measure perception than it is performance? Sure, yeah. sure. And, and, and there's an article by um, that's an American psychologist by Kaiser Hogan and Craig in uh, 2007, I believe. And they make a really important point that uh, performance and perceptions are different. And very often we will have perceptual measures of performance, but, but hard objective measures of performance uh, are kind of what we really want to get at. Mm -hmm. And those, those are hard to find in leadership studies. Did you ever work in that area? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I did uh, studies of small group behavior, and we looked mm -hmm. at, at how effective they were in mm -hmm. uh, various outcomes. So that's a, a small group behavior is a relatively small universe over a relatively short amount of time? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, when we started down this path, you mentioned a scholar named Cuddy. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that I got that right, and do you, know, do you have a full name on C U D D Y. C U D D Y. Okay. There's an article by uh, Cuddy, which um, and there's a pretty famous TED talk that she did where uh, she talks about sort of faking it till you make it. Basically, <laughs> I think those are the terms she uses. And uh, and she talks about body posture and stuff like that, and you know, behave as if you're a leader and you'll become a leader. Um, doesn't seem, doesn't seem to replicate. Does it work? No. no. Uh, but I think it's because it's it's a focus on the surface structure mm -hmm. of the behavior. What what would work is if you get people to believe that they can do something. Mm -hmm. Make sure we're live again here. Okay, we're good. So, so we were talking about uh, um, cut, cutty stuff yeah. and dealing with surface structures like yeah. body postures. But um, what's important is what people think they are. Mm -hmm. And so, if you dealt with people's beliefs that they can be a, a leader and uh, acting in a way that reflects that and then having social support in terms of people acknowledging that, then you can get a leadership identity developing. And uh, I think that can, can change people. Mm -hmm. Do you make a distinction between leaders and managers? Oh yeah, I think you have to. Okay. Well, how, what, what, what is that distinction for you? Well for me, uh, it, it ties into the definition that uh, we started out with, and that is that leadership is a social perception process that involves exercising influence. And uh, you have to be perceived as a leader. Mm -hmm. So lots of managers are doing things and uh, implementing procedures, following routines, and they're not trying to exercise leadership, and they're not perceived as being leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're still doing a good job as managers. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, there's a, a really good book by uh, Katz and Kahn in 1966. that's called Social Psychology of Organizations, I believe. And uh, they talked about leadership as <clears throat> filling in this, between the structures. Uh, doing things that aren't necessarily formally laid out. And then uh, 
on a bigger scale, uh, Tushman and Romanelli talk about what they call uh, convergent and reorientation periods and sort of a, a punctuated equilibrium model of how things evolve. And you have convergent periods where things function pretty consistently, and then you have reorientations when things change radically, and it's in those periods that leaders likely have the most influence. And reorientation would be because of some trauma in the organization, or a change in leadership, or? Or, or vision, or, or uh, competitive response, or something like that, or change in the environment. So I'm, I'm interested in something that you said a while ago about the time lag that it takes for a leader to come into a situation and then have an impact. Yeah. Would, like, without saying what it is, in a relatively short amount of time, I'm going to be interviewing a man who took over a very large corporation when I was in a state of crisis. When somebody comes into a situation like that, it's usually with the expectation that they're going to have an impact right now. But what you're saying is that it really takes a while yep. for a person. So how do organizations, you've, you've done a lot of work with organizations, how do they reconcile what really seems like an expectation that conflicts with reality? Well, um, there's a perceptual aspect. And so that if they come in and they're perceived as a leader and perceived as uh, creating change or stabilizing things, then in part that happens. But then almost always, People who come in want to change key personnel, that takes time. They want to develop policies that are different, that takes time. Uh, they want to uh, have those policies result in structures that can implement what they're doing, that takes time. So for example, uh, what I think is probably a leadership failure is uh, if you look at the Navy, we've had five or six accidents where ships have run into things. Mm -hmm. uh, why does that happen on a sy systemic basis? And why, why does it happen all of a sudden? And so, I mean, they investigate it, they uh, change leaders, but they've got to change their policy and the training and mm -hmm. figure out what's causing this. And that's going to take some time. Um, again, in reference to the what's become really a massive body of scholarship, interdisciplinary scholarship on leadership, um, in your experience, do the scholars of leadership talk to each other across disciplinary boundaries? Does the psychologist talk to the sociologist, talk to the historian, talk to the management expert? I mean, I mean. Uh, I don't think there's one answer to that question. You know, some do, some don't. I, I guess don't I, think I, I, I'll, I'll be a little more specific because I was trying not to lead the witness. I'm an academic in a different field and you spent a long career as an academic and people tend to go into their own disciplinary silos and stay there. Um, and I'm wondering what I was really looking for is leadership one of those fields where people have managed to reach out across the, the boundaries of the silo or do we function in these silos in this I'm sure they have. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it develops. So uh, there's a, like a, a renewed interest in evolutionary aspects of leadership. There's always been a social aspect. Uh, uh, so it's, you know, take social psychology. Is that psychology or is it sociology? So there's always been a, a dual focus there. Uh, Currently, like we're working in the area of quantum physics and cognitions and how that affects things. So um, I'm really excited to talk to you about that later on. Yeah, I hardly yeah. contain myself. Yeah, it's, 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 it's it leads you to think in different ways, mm -hmm. and so that changes what you do and how you look at the field. Tell me what you mean by the evolutionary aspect of leadership. Uh, well, so there's a really nice article in 2015 by uh, um, I'm not sure I'll get the name right, but it's like 
S-P-A-S-I-K, and colleagues, and, uh, and their argument is that um, as time develops and societies change, there are certain structures that change <coughs> and, and the, the need for types of leadership changes. So for example, if you have uh, societies that are hunter-gatherers and you have a clan structure, the, what leadership is in that uh, context is going to be quite different than what leadership is when you have an agrarian society and people can own land and you have more of hierarchical uh, leadership and, and property, property rights and that's associated with leadership. And then when you develop an industrial revolution and you have corporate leadership, that's still different. It's not family leadership, it's corporate leadership and stockholders that you're responsible for. And then in sort of a post-industrial society uh, there's where it's much more fluid and people can communicate better, there's still different kinds of leadership skills and structures that are required. And so that as the environment changes, various kinds of structures develop and uh, the argument I think would be that in a, a social sense, social structures can be selected much more quickly than uh, genetic structures. Mm -hmm. But there's still the same arguments that there's variety and, and processes that work in that particular situation will be retained. And, the, and that will lead to different kinds of outcomes. So are you thinking in terms of kind of a natural selection process, social natural selection process in, in leadership that some things work and if they work, they in effect reproduce themselves and multiply and if they well, don't, well, they die out? Well, <laughs> well, sure, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, I mean, you, you see that in some ways and I think it gets speeded up when you have uh, better communications and you can see what somebody does one day it's on the news or it's on Twitter or it's on YouTube the next day you know so everybody can see it. Well the, the question that was in the back of my mind as you were talking is how does one function in this kind of evolutionary environment when the speed of change accelerates the way the world is that we live in now or things are changing the Social structures are changing so rapidly. What does that say about leaders and leadership? Oh, that's a really good question. I don't think that the leadership field has their has an answer to that yet. Complexity theorists would argue that you know you need to develop what is called requisite complexity and sort of you need to match the complexity of some sort of organizational system to the complexity of the environment in terms of change. And uh, a lot of that matching has to do with how processes between units operate. Mary Eubing is a big proponent of that approach. And so relational aspects of leadership and what happens in between people rather than what people do or in between organizations uh, is, is a really important aspect to look at and to understand. And, and then it's, it, what happens in, in local relations sort of uh, accumulates as you move up in terms of uh, bigger and bigger systems and how does it accumulate? Does it change as it accumulates? Those are important questions. It's what we call the difference between compositional aggregation, <coughs> where things aggregate but they keep the same form versus compilational aggregation, and as you create an aggregate, it's different. And many kinds of thought processes and social processes, when we move from micro to macro, it phenomena change in qualitative ways. So you need to be able to understand and influence that. I had planned to ask you about complexity theory later on when it fit, but because you mentioned it, and somebody's going to get to this point in the interview, and most people aren't going to know what you're talking about. Could you sort of <clears throat> briefly say what that is and how you apply it to your work? 
Well, complexity theory deals with how dynamic systems that are complex operate. And the key point is to realize that in complex systems, when components interact, they create something different. So you can't disaggregate the system and look at this component, this component, and this component by themselves. You have to understand how they all function together. And the way that they function together may be quite different uh, uh, and, and may not even be something that can be disaggregated. So, um, so then you have to say, well, how can we study those kinds of systems? And a lot of the study is with uh, simulations of how models of systems work. But it's also how uh, how leaders can do things that change the way systems evolve. In the terms of complexity theorists, leaders can catalyze, but they can't control the way processes emerge. And uh, so we, we talked about sort of left versus right hemisphere processes and promotion versus prevention. Well, so if you're a leader and you want systems to be creative, uh, you, you, but you don't know what the creativity is, you can emphasize less he left hemisphere promotion kinds of processes and create a culture that would um, emphasize creativity, maybe tolerate some mistakes, mm -hmm. uh, as long as you learn from those mistakes. Um, and, and systems under that kind of leadership would evolve differently than systems under a prevention kind of orientation. Uh, you'd have perhaps more stability. So the, 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 the problem most organizations face is they have to do what they do effectively. Okay, so that's kind of prevention and efficiency oriented. But they also have to adapt and be ahead of the curve in terms of learning, and that's uh, 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 promotion-oriented or, or what uh, has been called exploration and exploitation. Exploration being more promotion kinds of things. And so uh, there's an interest in what's called ambidextrous leadership, where kinds of leaders who can do both. Yeah. That's where I, I, I tried to, to go earlier. So uh, an organization, an effective organization would have some institutional awareness that both of those processes are in play, yeah. and an effective leader would as well. Yeah. Um, so complexity theory, how, how does that relate to, similar to, different from chaos theory, which also is factored into your work, as I recall? Well, chaos theory deals with uh, systems that don't repeat themselves. Yeah. And complexity theory, you have complex systems but the, they're stable for a while, and, and ideally they repeat themselves uh, with some consistency, but then they may move on to different states. Right. So I think there's quite a bit of difference. Uh, I, I guess what I was asking you is, are both of those theories in play when you talk about organizations? Sure, I mean, you'll see a lot of people who are complexity theorists that argue that uh, organizations want to operate at the edge of chaos. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't. They want to, don't want to be chaotic. There's no predictability. There's no potential for skills to develop, et cetera. But if they're close to it, they're thinking that they could be innovative, mm -hmm. and uh, then they will innovate better than somebody else and gain a competitive advantage. Uh, and that's a theory. It's an interesting way to look at it. So. Field of leadership studies, do you think it's contributed to a broader understanding of leadership that reaches and influences non-specialists, citizens, voters? Are people like that influenced by the field of leadership studies? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's a good question. How would I know that? I just, I'm an academic. I teach, I teach a, a very small group of people. Uh, but it's getting bigger. And well, I mean, let me ask, turn the question around then. Should they be? Uh, 
Yeah. Should that field have an, yes. I don't mean you go to lecture on the street corner, but yes, I mean. Yes, they should. Yeah. Uh, and the problem is, is it's an industry and there's so much stuff out there. And it's like uh, medicine uh, in the sense of there's all these uh, products that are out there to try and help you get better or be well. And uh, people don't understand the process, but they can go to a doctor and get some advice. There isn't any doctor that, you, that we routinely go to in terms of understanding the leadership stuff. So, you know, everybody can walk through the airport and, you know, buy a book that's out there at uh, whatever bookstores in your right. airport, and, and, and there's going to be a section where they have popular leadership right. books, whether it's leadership according to Attila the Hun or uh, Elon Musk or, or Steve Jobs or what have you. Uh, and some of them are just baloney, and some of them might have some insightful things. So how do people know? Um, and so, I mean, it's like a marketplace, and this buyer beware. It's so, uh, but I think that people who, people who get leadership training or follow the advice of people with a, a, a good history and a good reputation in the sciences probably get something worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Do you consider yourself to be a leader? Uh, not really. I mean, you have been. A yeah, I have been, and I. Yeah, uh, I'm in a leadership position, uh, but and uh, what I do uh, is effective. Uh, so in that sense, I'm a leader, and people perceive me as a leader. But do I consider myself to be a leader? No, I'm just doing, you know, I'm working on studies, I'm working with people, trying to solve particular problems. Mm -hmm. But I have a lot of, uh, I consider myself to be more of a writer than a leader. I mean, the first, usually the first three or four hours that I spend of every day is writing, because mm -hmm. I'm at a computer. Uh, but I have a job where I do a lot of leadership stuff, and uh, it's effective. Uh, a lot of it's just coping with problems, but some of it is, some of the people will think is visionary, but it wasn't. It was just happenstance, you know, and it worked out well. Uh, and I can give you an example of that if you want. <clears throat> So um, one of the things that people would sort of look at my career in the last few years and say, well, that's visionary leadership. Somebody just said that to me a day ago when we were talking about it, is that we have, at Durham University, we have developed a network of leadership scholars, of implicit leadership theory scholars. And, um, and we, we got a grant from the Leverhulm Trust, and so we've had meetings every year for four years now. And it, it's really a, uh, a interesting group of people because it's international, so it's, it's all over the world. And people will look at it and say, oh, well, how'd you create that? Well, here's the, here's the real, did you ever, who was the guy that used to be on the radio that say, uh, Paul Harvey, and now you know the rest of the story. Yeah. Did you ever listen to Paul Harvey? I did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so here's the rest of the story. Um, shortly after I went to Durham, uh, I went to a conference in the U.S., and my graduate student, who was a postdoc at Durham then, presented a paper on, uh, it was a computer simulation model of uh, social perceptions, and somebody else, a lady by the name of Stephanie Johnson, who was in Colorado, uh, presented a paper in the same symposium. I didn't organize the symposium. I was just sitting there in the audience. But since I know people, I was talking to them afterwards, and I said, you know, these two people would have benefited from collaborating. And they could have done a better job if they worked together. They both did an excellent job. 
but there was there's a potential for synergy that mm -hmm. we were missing. Um, and so people said, yeah, well, uh, we, should, we should have meetings and we should do something more uh, interactive. And so I said, yeah, that's a good idea. And uh, so I went home and I we were back to the hotel and I was talking to my wife about it. And uh, you know, you're coming from the UK to the US. The next morning we had jet lag. <laughs> And so I'm, I'm up at four in the morning, nothing's going on, and I'm thinking, uh, we should have a workshop where we bring all these people together. So I said to my wife, I said, what do you think of this? Because she's up too. She says, that's a good idea. And I said, well, I'm in a business school now. I'll just email Birgit, which is Birgit Shins, who right. was still there, and I said. Was instrumental in getting you to the UK. Is yeah, 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 exactly. And I said, uh, I'll have Birgit ask the dean if he would fund a, a, a workshop to so bring these people together. And so I, I emailed Birgit. I said, hey, Birgit, can you do this? And tell him we need to know in 24 hours, because we have another <laughs> symposium, and uh, we just need $30,000 for it. So the dean wasn't too happy, but he said, OK. And so the, the same group then met two days later in a different symposium, and I said, oh yeah, well, the dean said we can support it and we can uh, sort of develop a, a meeting. And uh, so we talked about how we do it, and, uh, and then we did have bring these people to Durham to have this uh, workshop, and then that led into a, a grant proposal that a number of people worked on, and we got a grant, and then we've had three meetings from that, and then that snowballed into where we then at the last meeting got associated with Army Research Institute and then we did a proposal to continue this with the Army Research Institute uh, at their invitation. And so I think it's going to continue, but really it was an emergent process. There wasn't a whole lot of vision involved. It was just looking at something that happened and saying, you know, that could have been better if we'd have had a different structure and then being awake and so you had a chance to think about it and having a dean who would uh, uh, say okay and a group of people who wanted to organize and so largely, uh, although I had the grant, uh, it was just a, a whole bunch of really talented people wrote the proposal. Uh, and uh, the same thing with uh, the grant for the Army Research Institute. Uh, uh, I couldn't have done it by myself. I have great colleagues that I work with. But don't you think that sometimes vision is just seeing that thing that a little bit differently than someone else did and then persuading people to come along? Yes, but... And you're really good at that, aren't you? Uh, yeah, but <laughs> here's the thing. You don't know where you're going. The vision assumes... But well, that's the secret, isn't it? Yeah, the vision assumes that when you get to some place, that you, you could see it, you know, like you I know can see there. that building out yeah. there and say, okay, I want to walk to that building. But you could say, you don't know where you're walking to. Uh, and, and it's something that the outcomes are different than if you hadn't done what you've done, but you don't know exactly what they're going to be. You know, your, your colleagues who I, I spoke to and who are incredibly fond of you, um, said that one of, the, one of your outstanding qualities is the ability to think big, to understand and articulate the big picture, but stay focused. Right? Isn't that sort of what vision is, is to see those points on the horizon and then have enough focus and, and initiative to walk in that direction and get other people to go with you? Yeah, except you don't see those points on the horizon. Oh. That's the point that I'm trying to make. Okay. Is that, and when we, uh, when we talk about quantum theory, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but um, they're there. Mm -hmm. You don't know they're there. And so you find out about them by doing things. It's mm -hmm. what, you know, it's the difference between exploration and exploitation. In exploration, you're kind of doing things that allow you to find out what the potential in the environment is. And, and March noted this, and like he's got a great paper in 1991. So uh, uh, we've known about that since then. March. Uh, he said, 
I think his name is James March, but he's at Stanford. He's a pretty famous uh, uh, organizational researcher. I you know, should, I'm just trying to help the transcriber here. With yeah, me. sure. Uh, Simon and March had a really famous uh, book on organizations uh, years ago. Or maybe it was March and Simon. So one of the people that I talked about your career with is Roseanne Foti? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, I wasn't exactly sure how to pronounce it, but I should have asked her when I talked to her. But um, So she suggested this question. And I, okay. I, I'm going okay. to give her the footnote here. So she, she pointed out that the relatively recent focus of your research has been on self-identity and its relationship to leadership. You know, leadership mm -hmm. influ influence others' identities and others' identities can shape the leadership interaction and so on. So here's the question. Um, can you reflect a little on your own leadership identity over the course of your career? Oh, sure. And I think it's really helpful uh, to think about this from uh, a perspective that um, Alver M Matt Alverson uh, mentioned at a conference I was at in uh, May in, in a beautiful place in Mykonos. But he said that in, in their consulting work, they find a lot of people who are doing leadership activities, but they don't see themselves as leaders until other people label them as such. Okay, and I think that's the case for me. Uh, I was department chair for five years at uh, a university, and it was a period of change. We'd had a head, and we moved to a chair, and the head had been there um, probably 20 years. And so we have sort of shifted the culture, and you just do what you think needs to be done. And, uh, and I didn't really see myself as the leader. I was I'm aware of the fact that I'm being recorded, so I won't say my, I'll, I'll use, choose my words carefully, but the uh, job had a lot of aspects that were annoying. I was a department chair. I, I, I can appreciate the annoying parts of it. Yeah, yeah, and so, uh, and, and the same thing now with uh, this uh, network, and uh, we have a center for leadership and followership. There's a lot of things that you do that you create structures and then you respond to things that maybe are dumped on you and you've, you've got to deal with them. Um, but you don't see that as leadership, it's just problem solving. But other people might see it as leadership and then after a while you sort of say, okay, yeah, it, it is because it's creating a, uh, uh, a global perception that has impact. and. Uh, and uh, it's an indirect structure. Mm -hmm. It's the you know, way things function and the way things are perceived by others. And that's important. So here's what I was wondering. So the, the man who's been in you know, a, a long career um, dealing with perceptions, um, the perceptions that followers have of leaders and the way that leaders shape the perceptions of followers and that whole process that we'll talk more about later on. Are you self-consciously aware of that? when you're in a leadership position? Are you, uh, are you practicing your own social science or are you just, just doing it? <laughs> mostly I'm doing it, but there are some things that you're aware of too. Mm -hmm. you know? So for example, uh, I'm pretty informal. Now it's tomorrow you'll see me in a very different... Uh, I normally would, I put the tie on yeah. out of respect for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, well tomorrow I'll, I'll have a three-piece suit on. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I mean, I. I thought about that uh, consciously in my career because I want to work with students and other people in a way that makes them comfortable mm -hmm. and minimizes the status differences. And some ways you do that is how you dress. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, so it's something. I mean, it's the way I'm comfortable in dressing anyway, but I also think about it. Um, and uh, there's, there's two aspects to it. There's uh, the aspect of the way you're perceived and uh, being aware of that. But it's also the aspect of how someone else perceives you then affects the way that they interact with you. And you want the interactions to be uh, productive and so you really have to behave in a way that 
people feel comfortable, they're not self-focused, they're not focused on you, they're focused on what you're doing. Um, and normally I'm focused on what we're doing, not the way I'm being perceived. Well, for the small sample of your former students that I spoke to, I, they're representative, it works. So, um, so uh, one more general question and then I, I'm gonna narrow down here a bit. So um, one of the things about leadership studies, again, is the explosion of books and articles in the field. And given that massive volume of literature that's available, um, which, I don't know, four or five books or articles would you most recommend that someone read? I mean, if someone said to you, I, I want to get started, or what do you recommend? What, what would you put on the list of must-reads? Well, the number one must-read is a textbook that's coming out by Antonakis and Day. It's called The Nature of Leadership, third edition. And I think it's out in the US, and it's uh, it'll be out in. I think it is. Yeah, yeah and, and, but it's not out in the UK until December, at least according to Amazon UK. That's David Day. David Day. Yeah. Um, I'll say it is the best book in leadership. Anybody who's serious about leadership mm -hmm. should read it cover to cover and then read it again. Mm -hmm. um, so that being my number one choice, um, because it brings together a number of scholars and they talk about areas that they're expert in. Uh, and I don't have a chapter in the book. I had a chapter in it, uh, second edition, and they cut my chapter. So. Oh. Mm -hmm. so, probably with good reason. So you're, well, I, 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 I did see an <laughs> earlier version, and you were in there. So. Yeah, yeah, um. but, um, uh, so, so it's- So this is the third edition. It's the third edition. Yeah. It's, it's an excellent book. So that's number one. Uh, if you want to understand uh, leadership perceptions, I would start with um, Lord and Mayor, which is a 1991 yeah. book. It's been cited a lot. Uh, this was written, Karen Mayer was a graduate student at the time and she's just a wonderful scholar and a good writer uh, and she, since she's deceased she had brain cancer and died I think when she was 46. But um, it's a good book for someone to get an introduction to a cognitive information processing and perspective. Leadership and information processing. Uh, uh, the first half is probably better than the second half of the book. Um, so that would be a second book. Uh, honestly, I mean, I've, I've read George McGregor Burns's book, and I, I didn't get that much out of it. <laughs> Sorry to say that, so it wouldn't be high on my list. It's a great book, but for someone who didn't know a lot about leadership, uh, it wouldn't be my first choice. Um, if I pick a third book to read, uh, it's a book by Henry Sapp, S-A-P-P, -P, called Mind Matter and uh, something else. And Sapp is a Nobel Prize winning physicist. So he talks about reality and how reality occurs and what quantum theory has to do with it. And it just leads you to think in ways that people don't normally think, but I think it's helpful for leaders. Um, so that would be number three. Uh, uh, number four. I'm going back to Dave Day again. There's a, if you want to understand leadership training, I would read Day, Halpin, and uh, I forgot his third author. They have like a 2009 book that deals with leadership development and uh, training. And uh, it's so good because it, it starts out with an adult development perspective. Hmm. And, um, it just brings in a lot of literature, um, so I guess I'm up to four. That's okay. I mean, four is enough if you want. Okay. I, uh, I almost always ask people this question just to see what what they think is stands out about uh, in that. Yeah. Uh, I, I, well, I, if I, I pick something that 
I also did a book on identity with uh, Doug Brown, who's a wonderful scholar. It's, it's Lord and Brown, and it's a 2004 book. But I think it's dated. But if you were interested in identity, that might be one place to start. And then you'd have to go to some of the uh, more recent work that's been published in journal articles and stuff like that. Uh, there's, there's also things like the, uh, if you're a leadership scholar um, and wanted to know how to do good leadership research, there's a book that's coming out by uh, Shins, Novus, and Hall, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it deals with, it's called the Handbook of Leadership Methodology. So it deals with a lot of methodological questions that range from uh, how you do experiments to how you measure variables to how you do data analysis and stuff like that. So that would be, I picked that as number five. So last question before I ask you the really simple stuff. Um, professionally, who do you look up to? Who inspires you? Or who has inspired you professionally? Uh, well, uh, early in my career, I mean, I have to say Herb Simon, uh, who uh, is a great, great psychologist, mathematician, uh, economist, you, you name it, uh, uh, first psychologist to win a Nobel Prize. Uh, but he was like, uh, he'd walk to school, uh, and uh, he's, he'd eat lunch with students every day, and uh, uh, if you talk to him, you're just talking to another person like you and I are talking, uh, uh, but he's amazingly productive. Uh, so that would be somebody. Uh, golly, some of my colleagues inspire me. Roseanne does. Uh, uh, Dave Day does. They're they're both better than I am, you know, in terms of knowing the in terms well, of knowing the leadership Rose literature. Hand, but Dave Day is just the opposite. <laughs> you were better than he is. No, no, <laughs> he's, he's a, a they, and uh, person Berger Chins is 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 great. And then people have different skills. So mm -hmm. person that I'm, I'm uh, right next to office wise now, uh, Suzanne Braun is just a. She's younger, but she's an exceptional scholar. She inspires me every time I have a meeting with her. She just is so much more on the ball than I am. Um, uh, but in the leadership field, um, I think people who move the field forward, like I think Jim Mindel did great stuff. Uh, uh, I didn't know him very well. Uh, I think I had sat next to him once having lunch at the conference, and that was the extent of my interaction, but I read his stuff, and, and that was really good. Um, uh, Bruce Avolio obviously, has been really successful. Bruce was one of our students. Avolio. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so... Jerry Hunt, who uh, has passed away, he, and Jerry was a great organizer and a great uh, person to help new colleagues along in their careers. Um, so he had an in impact on me early on that I think I only appreciated later on in my life. So and he was a colleague at. He wa Jerry Hunt was in, in, in your state. He was at Carbondale. Oh. Well, it's Illinois. Illinois. Sorry. Yeah, 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 but it's not too far away. Not, it's, we're neighbors. Yeah, uh, for a while, and then he moved to Texas Tech. Mm -hmm. But he used to have these Carbondale biannual symposia on leadership in the 70s. And when we first presented our stuff on categorization theory, Roseanne Fodi and I went down to one of those uh, symposia. And Bernie Bass. I think at the time didn't think, he, he was a commenter, and I think he just sort of said, well, okay. But then later on he said, yeah, this is a pretty decent theory. Um, but so Jerry Hunt was a, a, great, a great person in the leadership field. He was a good so scholar. So in the 1970s, if he was having these conferences 
every other year. Yeah. Then he was sort of on the cutting edge of where the field was going. Absolutely. It was a, was a nascent field in those days. Yeah, yeah. You know. And and so people looked up to him. Uh, not a leadership person, but Jim Naylor was also somebody who uh, uh, had an impact on me early in my career. So. And who was Jim Naylor? He, Jim Naylor was at, at Purdue. He was department head there, and then he went to Ohio State and was department head there. He was a, a psychologist that founded a organizational behavior and human performance. Oh. It was a journal, and then it became organizational performance and human decision making. So it's instead of OBHP, it was OBHDP. And he also developed this group called Society for Organizational Behavior, which was his sort of 50 top mm -hmm. people in the field, and you get together and have uh, yearly meetings. Um, and that still uh, existed. But I'll tell you a story, and this is, this is a funny story. The first stuff that we did on implicit leadership theories, we um, sent to JAP, it's Journal of Applied Psychology, and we got a desk rejection. It was like three or four sentences, and the one that sticks in my mind is the comment, this manuscript is a decrement to the leadership literature and should not be published anywhere. <laughs> well, and, I got tipped off to ask you questions along that line. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we sent it to OBHDP, and uh, Naylor liked it and published it, you know? So but the, the piece that you initially got rejected, that was one of your early pieces on implicit leadership theory. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, Rush, Thomas, and Lord. So it came out in 1977 in OBHDP. And, uh, People still cite it today. It's got a few hundred citations, maybe more. No, but I've uh, got it on my desktop. Huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it didn't get a wildly enthusiastic reception from Journal of Applied Psychology uh, when we sent it there. And so, but so Naylor was always looking for something new, something innovative, and um, I think he helped the field along. Well, and he also rode the right horse on that one, didn't he? I mean. The, the thing that got rejected is really, it wasn't too long before it was at the forefront of the field. So, mm -hmm. so I'm going to ask you some really easy questions just to get this stuff Sure. In there. So when and where were you born? Well, I was born in Detroit, Michigan in uh, 1946, mm -hmm. in February 16th. And where did you grow up? And the first part of my life I was in Detroit, you know, a, a suburb, well, an uh, outer which, part of the city <laughs> called Redford. Yeah. Till I was five, and then we moved to uh, uh, out further to what was a more rural area called Farmington, and then it became Farmington Hills. Mm -hmm. And uh, I lived there till I went to college, and it was a great place to grow up. Uh, was it different area? Uh, it's like it, it was in a transition from rural to urban, but when I was there, we were in a subdivision that started out, and there were just a few houses, so you might ride your bike a couple miles to have kids to play with, you know? And then 10 years later, there was a house in every lot, but we always had room to play baseball or, you know, goof around and stuff like that, so it was a nice place to be a kid. Do you have any brothers and sisters? I have three sisters. Mm -hmm. Older or younger? One older, two younger. Uh, my sister Barbara's four years older than me, and then I have sister Beverly, who's a year and a half younger, and then sister Beth, who's nine years younger. And who were your parents? Uh, my mom, uh, her name was Delma Grace Dixon Lord. She grew up in Canada, mm -hmm. in uh, uh, Walkerville. She came to the U.S. Uh, her dad moved to the U.S. during the Depression for work. Um, and then she met my dad uh, on a double date. Ended up... Those were always dangerous. <laughs> yeah, ended up uh, on a double date because uh, he had a car and her brother wanted to take somebody out and didn't have a car. <laughs> so <laughs> life has all these quirks that just change the way things happen. 
Uh, my dad was, uh, his name was George Theodore Lord, and uh, he grew up in Detroit, mm -hmm. worked in the auto industry uh, all his life. On the line? He was a, uh, he was a engineer in truck development, so uh, he wasn't an uh, assembly person, but he sort of did testing mm -hmm. of new trucks in, in applied situations, so he traveled a lot. So I, I'm going to try to ask you a question and get at the, your youth and the impact it had on the man that you became. And because of your field, I, I, this may be close enough for this to work, so we'll see. Um, this will either work or it won't. So in October 2011, I had the pleasure of interviewing Manfred Getz de Vries yeah. at the ILA in London. And to get ready for that, I read an article that he published in 1994 called The Leadership Mystique. Um, Okay. And the one thing that he said in that article just really jumped out at me. And I tried it out on him and it worked. So uh, he says in that piece, he said, all of us possess some kind of inner theater and are strongly motivated by a specific inner script. Over time, through interactions with caretakers, teachers, and other influential people, this inner theater develops. Our internal theater, inner theater, in which the patterns that underlie our character come into play influences our behavior throughout our lives and plays an essential role in the molding of leaders. So using his term, inner theater, can you tell me about your inner theater? Uh, that's a tough one. I, I mean, I'm really task-oriented. So know? when you look back on your youth or young adulthood, are there things about people you met, events that took place that inspired you or shaped you and stayed with you for the rest of your life? Yeah, sure. Uh, mm -hmm. Two things. Uh, one, I like to play baseball. And I sort of thought I would be a baseball player, but <laughs> as I... Uh, a lot of boys want to be baseball players. Yeah, yeah. As I got into <laughs> high school and stuff, I realized I wasn't fast enough or strong enough. I was a kid who was big early on, but I'm, I mean, I'm not that tall now, but I was this tall when I was 12, you know, so I was a big kid, and, uh, and it helps with athletics, but uh, uh, that wasn't the best route for me. Uh, but I still enjoy baseball. In fact, uh, I'm an Indians fan, and very unhappy Indians fan at the moment, Cleveland but they, Indians. yeah, right. but they had a they had a great uh, season in mm -hmm. lots of ways. Um, but the other thing <clears throat> is, well, I was probably always kind of quantitative, but uh, when I was a kid, you'd get the box scores, mm -hmm. and so you tend to think in terms of batting averages and who went one for three, two for four, how would their average change, etc. And uh, it's kind of a, a domain in which you can think about numbers and how they change and how things uh, evolve from day to day. And uh, so that's, that's probably good training, you know, for somebody who uh, uh, does scientific stuff. I was, I was thinking that when you said baseball, that seems like a social scientist's perfect game. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so how about your parents? What kind of... A, impact, lasting impact that they had on you? Oh, well, um, I, I mean, this is in retrospect. Um, I'd, I'd say two things. Uh, from my mom, uh, I got the sense that she was always there to support me. You know, whatever we did, she'd still love you and uh, it wouldn't necessarily be okay, but uh, she'd be in your camp. From my dad, uh, it was a willingness to sort of discuss issues and think about different points of view. I mean, he, he was always willing to, I won't say argue, but go through issues where we had different perspectives. And, and you know, he was a truck engineer, so we talk about fuel economy and I said, well, small cars are better. No, 10 miles per gallon, you know, the bigger cars are better. Well, who thinks in terms of 10 miles per gallon when, when you're thinking about the 
efficiency of an automobile. Right. Only a truck engineer, you know. So, uh, so you could have different perspectives, but he'd listen and, and discuss things. And sort of that's kind of what scientists do, you know. Uh, they should do anyway. So I think I got those two things from uh, my parents. And then a, a quirky thing, which I'm not sure uh, whether it's just a figment of my imagination or not, but being in the UK, uh, people notice we have a strange accent. Americans have a strange Amer accent. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. <laughs> and. Um, they're always kind and they say, are you Canadian? Rather than say it, are you American at the moment? And I don't know if uh, that's because I sound just a little bit Canadian because my mom grew up in Canada or whether they're just trying to be nice to us or whether they're just not sure. So um, it's comment on the times and the way the U.S. is perceived. That's something, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I've spent a lot of time in Newcastle, Newcastle University working with colleagues, so I... Uh, where did you attend high school? Farmington High School. Um, and were you a good student? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm very much a product of uh, good public education, you know. So high schools were good. They had... And uh, like in seventh grade, they kind of sort of tracking you, sort of had accelerated classes. So now they'd be like um, uh, classes where people get college credit or something. So, but then it was just, you know, like honors classes or something like that. While you were of high school age, were there any individuals besides your parents who had a significant influence on your life trajectory? I'm sure there were. Uh, probably the teacher that stands out most is a guy by the name of Lee Peel, P-E-E-L-E, -E -E, who was an English teacher. And uh, I, we'd read a lot of books, uh, but then uh, he would have us do things like painting. So we, I mean, we had a class where we did oil painting in English, and we had to yeah. write poetry and stuff like that. So uh, it was it was fun. It was inventive and different. Do you think that he nurtured the eclectic interests that stayed with you for the rest of your life? Uh, just maybe to some extent. So you graduated from high school and went to the University of Michigan, earned a BA in economics in 1968. Yep. Why did you decide to major in economics? Oh, that's crazy. What was the attraction? Yeah, it's a crazy thing. Uh, I mean, neither of my parents went to college, so I, I had no idea what college was all about. But my sister went to the University of Michigan, and so it was pretty cool. So I thought I'd go there, and uh, it was pretty cool, a great school. Uh, and I started out, at the time, I thought, well, I kind of like music, I played the trumpet, but I mean, these kids who, who are music majors are just worlds ahead of me. And, uh, but it, it had a good music school, and I was actually in engineering. I wanted to be a civil engineer, and uh, realized uh, I don't have the mind of an engineer, uh, and as no criticism, I'm just not as detail-oriented as engineers have to be. Uh, I'm the kind of person, when I take math, I get a C because, in calculus, because I drop a sign, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I understood what was going on, I just didn't do the calculations right. Um, but engineers can't get away with that. Um, but but it's, it's, so I switched from engineering to arts and sciences, and uh, uh, liked economics, uh, so I majored in economics and took a lot of psych classes and thought, well, I'm not sure I want to be an economist, uh, but I like psychology, so I went to graduate school in psychology. So you were, like a lot of undergraduates, just sort of looking and... Finding your way, finding yeah, way, yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't, I never had a class in economics in high school, although I, I'm sure we had one. Uh, 
but I will say one thing about uh, uh, University of Michigan is like the world was different then. State supported education and uh, it had a tremendous impact on me. So when I started out, tuition was $140 a semester. And uh, when I graduated, it was $210 a semester. And uh, I worked in summers in uh, auto assembly plants, it's where they were making Mustangs, and you know, 64 and 65, that was a big deal. You were, I, had, I had a 65 Mustang, yeah, maybe you made it. Yeah, yeah <laughs> could have, could have. Uh, but uh, you worked a lot of hours. And I'd take home $210, $220 a week. Mm -hmm. So it's like, where nowadays could somebody get a job where they could work a week, it was a hard week, and pay their whole college tuition? I, it just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And I think it's such a short-sighted change in terms of what happens. and so. Now students borrow a lot of money, they end up with a lot of debt, they're uh, forced then to, to take jobs where they make more, more money. Uh, uh, and I won't name names, but I've seen really good scholars take jobs because they had to pay off $100,000 worth of loans yeah. or something like that. So uh, it's just a different world. But it, University of Michigan was a great place to, uh, you could get world-class scholars in so many disciplines. It was just mind-boggling. Um, and so it was fun, you know? It was great for somebody who's in their late teens or early 20s. Um, so you graduated in 1968. Yeah. Um, when you, or at least figuratively, had that diploma in your hand, what did you think the rest of your life was going to look like? Where did you think you were headed? I knew where I was headed. Okay. Uh, I, and I'll give you another event. So Michigan has a, a union. It's, it's, uh, it's basically a, a building where there's a lot of activities, and they have mm -hmm. a grill in the bottom of it. And I, I had three apartment mates, and we were sitting in the union and Walter Cronkite came on the TV. This is like, and he starts talking about the Tet Offensive in Vietnam. And I said, what we all said, and I will just be brutally honest, we all said, oh, fuck, you know, we're all going to Vietnam. I think I probably said that myself. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and uh, let's see, one of my roommates was in Vietnam and uh, was an engineer. He was uh, dropped into Cambodia to build the roads back for the troops that were invading Cambodia. So that was his experience. Uh, another one w was uh, enlisted, and uh, he, was, he liked language, and so he had studied Russian and German. And he went to the Army Security Agency, and. Uh, uh, and he was supposed to go to Vietnam, and he was home on leave before they sent him to Vietnam, and Russia invaded Czechoslovakia, and so his orders got changed, and he got sent to Germany to listen to the Russians. I uh, went to graduate school and got drafted from graduate school. Uh, I was like the only American male in the group in Carnegie Mellon. It was, so the year that I went to, to graduate school, they were all Canadian males or American females, and I got drafted and went in the service in March, my first year. It would have been 1969. I was in the service till uh, uh, December 23rd, 1970, so 21 months I got out to go back to school. I saw that on you, and I was actually, before I talked to you about graduate school, I wanted to ask you about, you were drafted. Yeah. You had a draft number? A uh, year before, okay. yeah, I was 325. I would have been great well, after the lottery, but I was, I was already 36. in the service. Um, you went in as an enlisted person? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I wasn't enlisted, I was draftee. But I mean, you were, have a listed, enlisted rank. 
you were yes, a private. Yes, yeah, private, yeah. private uh, yeah. You won, yeah. So where were you stationed? Well, I was stationed in Fort Knox, Kentucky for uh, nine months, and then I was sent to Germany. Uh, it, it, wars are kind of funny. You know, uh, when they're building troops up, everybody goes to Vietnam. And when they're starting to bring the numbers down, then not so many people are being sent there. So I it was lucky that I went to graduate school because uh, uh, it, it reduced my chances of going to Vietnam. But then, because I was in graduate school, uh, when I uh, got out of basic training, uh, they made me a clerk, and I was in uh, uh, Army Intelligence. And uh, but then I wanted to do to do something in psychology, so. I requested that I could be moved to one place to like a military hospital. Instead, they put me in a stockade as a social worker. So that was interesting because um, talking about organizational climate, it's like when you go in and, and they open your office and then they lock the doors behind you, you say, this is weird. Yeah, so um, I did that for six or seven months, and then. Uh, so you were basically serving as a social worker for incarcerated troops. Yes. And where was this hospital? This was Fort Knox. Okay. And then uh, I came down on a levy to go to Germany to shape to be a liaison for a general, and um, so I got there, and they said, well, how well do you speak German? I said, oh, not very well. How well do you speak French? I said, oh, a little French. And they said, uh, this isn't going to work. Uh, so they made me a company clerk. And so I was a company clerk for a year, and then I got out of the service and went back to graduate school. So anything that you did in the service have an impact as you went forward with your career? As you thought about leadership or leadership uh, organizations? or? dysfunctional members of organizations in prison or? Well, well uh, sure. Uh, it's hard to say, you know, a specific example. Uh, just being in Europe for a year, I mean, it broadens your perspective. I got to travel a fair amount, uh, meet different people. I liked being in the service. I mean, I don't like the, the war part, but uh, you're with a bunch of guys, and they were pretty decent guys, and uh, you had similar experience, and so uh, uh, the job wasn't that hard. Uh, as a company clerk, if you're just organized and uh, careful. Uh, and you could type. And you could type, yeah. You had to be careful. Uh, uh, I had a, a really good commanding officer who treated you like uh, respectfully and uh, 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 was a was a decent person. His name was Captain Johns, mm -hmm. and uh, so it, it was largely a positive experience for me. Uh, in, in terms of the military, uh, in terms of uh, social processes, I mean, uh, you, almost all of the people that I was, went through basic training with, before they were out of basic training, they'd broken up with their girlfriends at home. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, so you get the Dear John letters, and uh, it, it just happens. Um, so, I mean, that, uh, that had an a impact, too. Uh, so, I mean, it's just, a, in any, anything, you're in a different situation. You grow, and you learn, and you develop. But I don't know that there's a particular leader or event or anything like that that uh, so you, had an you got out of the service, you went back to Carnegie Mellon? Yeah. Um, why did you pick Carnegie Mellon in the first place? <laughs> I didn't really have much choice. Uh, I applied to Michigan and Purdue and Carnegie Mellon, and I got accepted in each school and got offered scholarships. But Carnegie Mellon would let me teach. And so I knew if I went to the other two schools, I'd get drafted. And I thought, well, if I go to Carnegie Mellon, Will, will they draft a teacher? And the answer was yes. <laughs> and so that didn't help me either. So, but uh, so, so you took the offer that was going to let you teach from the get-go so you wouldn't get drafted. Yeah, and got drafted yeah. anyway. So you, you can't tell uh, how things will work out. And then I went back to Carnegie Mellon because I could get out of the service three months early to, to go back to school. 
Um, and it was a great place, and I kind of liked it anyway. Um, so as, as an undergraduate, you'd already been taking psychology courses. Oh, I had lots of psychology so classes. So your decision to specialize in psychology in graduate school was based upon the fact that you had these courses and liked the content. Yeah, and, okay. yeah. I mean, so I was going to talk to you about how you got from economics to psychology, but um, did you write a master's thesis? Yeah. And what was that about? Factors that predict who's likely to commit suicide or something so like that. So it wasn't much to do with leaders? or okay. It didn't have anything to do with leadership. So, but then you did um, write your pre-PhD, which you earned in 1975. You wrote a dissertation called Group Performance as a Function of Leadership Behavior and Tax Task Structure. Mm -hmm. um, how did you get from factors that contributed to suicide to leadership? Well, I got, well you asked me. I, I took okay. a class in, in yes, terms of small group yes, behavior. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so you took that as a <clears throat> master's student? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. there, you know, uh, you're a PhD student and uh, you get a master's. It's just uh, along the way. It's yeah, just your first, like first, blessing, you know, and <laughs> first research project. Yeah. It's not a, not a formal program. And uh, if you didn't get it, it wouldn't make any difference. But you, I did. And... Uh, you know, I so you took, you took a it. class, and okay. <clears throat> so, and then I'll be respectful of your time. But was your interest in leaders and leadership? Was your interest in leaders and leadership, or was it using leaders and leadership to build and test theories? Were you interested in building and testing theories, or interested in leaders and leadership? Uh, probably neither, you know, it's like... <laughs> that was a bad question. <laughs> no, no, uh, it's like, you look back at things, and that's not the understanding that you had then. It's like, I just wanted to get my dissertation done and uh, uh, get a job. I had a, a girlfriend who was an economist, and she got a job at Buffalo, and I wanted to get a job someplace close mm -hmm. to Buffalo, and uh, uh, it wasn't close enough. Things mm -hmm. just didn't work out, but uh, uh, I just, and then you get a, I think I probably was more interested in teaching when I first started, mm -hmm. and then uh, really realized Oh geez, there's this thing research. I mean, I've done research, and but you've got to publish, and uh, you've got to work with students, and they have to be able to publish. And uh, I was successful at it, and uh, so you kind of learn and change your identity as you went along. And some of it was social expectations of our department chair, who had high expectations, and some of it was I was just really successful and. Uh, I mean, I didn't see anything unusual about it. So the, the success that you had researching and analyzing and writing that dissertation persuaded you that research was something that interested in you and that you were good at and would like to maybe devote a career to that as opposed to teaching. Well, I don't think I was that far-sighted, <laughs> you know? I just did it, you know? You were supposed to do it and I did it. and. Uh, and I was reasonably successful at it. And then, you know, after the fifth or the eighth or the tenth publication, and then you realize, okay, I, I, you know, I'm publishing in good journals, and my students are working with me. We're publishing in good journals. Uh, 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 it's just kind of snowballs. That's probably the best term for it. Last question for this session. We'll talk about scholarship tomorrow. But, um, dissertations are supposed to add to knowledge, and keep in mind that you know people who listen to this are probably not going to be in your field. What was the contribution of your dissertation? What did you add to what we didn't know? Uh, well, two things. One, um, it had two parts. One was a performance part, and one was a social perception part. And the performance part dealt with uh, uh, 
how the functional behaviors required for effective per performance varied depending on the structure and the type of task that people were doing. So it really dealt with contingency views of functional leadership behavior and how that integrated with task typologies. And so um, I think that moved the field forward and specifically there was a paper that was published that on unstructured tasks. I mean, it does, seems like a no-brainer, but uh, it's nice to show this empirically that on unstructured tasks, uh, you need behaviors that structure them for people to be successful. Yeah, I mean, you're down in your head. It's like, seems like a no-brainer. Uh, but um, Well, it seems like a no-brainer after you do all the work. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, I mean, you develop a system, you can record these behaviors, you can see what's correlated with performance and how it varies across time. So, I mean, there's, it's empirical, but it's, uh, it makes sense, uh, at least to me now. The other part was a little bit more interesting because it dealt with who's perceived as a leader. And um, the basis of power that are associated with mm -hmm. leadership. And so I tried to manipulate reward power and expertise and legitimate power. Mm -hmm. And they all had effects on uh, a leadership in mm -hmm. ad hoc, which are newly formed uh, small groups. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we developed a measure of leadership perceptions. And this, this is kind of crazy, but I'll be honest. So, um, so what happens with a dissertation? You just make up stuff, you know? So we develop like these, don't tell anybody. <laughs> these items, like uh, this person w was perceived to contribute to the task, and I would, per I would like them to be a leader again uh, on a next group and stuff like that. And so, uh, so you know, these items uh, then were combined into a scale, and, uh, in, uh, so that was a dependent variable that was predicted by behaviors and these manipulations, and that got published in Administrative Science Quarterly, uh, which, which was a good journal. It's the first place I sent it, and uh, so I thought, well, this isn't, this isn't so bad, except for the JAP experience. Most of the stuff that I sent got published where I sent it, but um, uh, so that, that was the perceptual part. And, uh, and is that where the roots of implicit leadership theory are? No. In kind of an odd way, um, no, the roots of implicit leadership theory are, are it's really clear to me. It's like I got this issue of OBHDP, and uh, it had an article by Barry Stahl in it in 1975. I remember getting the journal, because you get journals in the mail. Right. They and lying yeah, on wrappers around them. <laughs> yeah, lying on the carpet, reading this, and I had this orange shag carpet in my apartment. It's really ugly, but um, so I remember reading this, thinking, "Damn, this is really good." Because what Staw showed is that if you give people, if you ask people to describe the performance and the processes in their group on a number of dimensions and you randomly assign them to conditions where they're told their group performed well or they performed poorly, that they describe the processes different. So it's kind of a backwards looking approach. And so Staw's comment or issue was, what do correlations between behavior and performance mean if performance is affecting the way uh, behaviors being described. And so that was the origin of what became called the performance cue effect, where we looked at it. And, and you did a meta-analysis of that later on, right? No, no, it no, was no. different meta-analysis. Okay, okay, right. Yeah, but, we, but I did do a meta-analysis. Uh, 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 I did do a, an article that dealt with that mm -hmm. issue in terms of aggregating stuff, but I don't think it was a meta-analysis. But um, uh, and then it, to the leadership coding stuff, it's like I knew how difficult it was to code behaviors and remember them because I'd spent hours and hours doing this and training people to be able to code this system that I developed. Uh, and I said, and you could spend two hours watching the group and then you come out and, and coding the behaviors, and you come out and someone say, 
well, what was the frequency of this behavior? He said, I have no idea. You know, I just did it, but I don't have any aggregate view of it. And so I didn't have much faith that people could uh, describe and, and give accurate frequency ratings of the leadership behaviors that they had been uh, exposed to. And then uh, there's another article published in 1975 that basically said you can uh, get the factor structure of leadership measures when people, this is Eden and Leviathan in 1975, and I think this one's in Journal of Applied Psychology. But um, you can get the same factor structure, which we use as a measure of how good a measure is, when people were describing a fictitious leader as when they were describing a real leader. So that suggests that the factor structure comes from the cognitive schema that people have for making sense of everyday leadership, not from their recollections of what actual behaviors they observe. So it's not a, a trait aspect of the leader so much as a perceptual structure that perceivers have to make sense of things. Mm -hmm. And so the Stahl article, the Eden and Leviathan article, and my experience in coding behaviors, all three of them they sort of came together and I said, this is really interesting. And you know, this behavioral rating may not be all it's cracked up to be. So that looks like that's a good place to stop. Okay. <laughs> and because I we went longer than I said we were going to. Um, so and the main reporter is on. So um, let's see, today is Saturday, October 14th, and I'm doing a second recording session with Robert Lord, who's a recipient of an International Leadership Association Lifetime Achievement Award. So thank you for agreeing to sit with me for a second time. Yeah, my pleasure. I want to ask your permission to record this interview, to have the interview transcribed, and to have the audio and transcription deposited with the IUPUI Library and Special Collections, the International Leadership Association, and the Tobias Center where they will be used by patrons, and that may include posting some or all of this to the internet. Yeah, sure, that's fine. Okay, all right. So, um, yesterday, um, we, we actually had a wide-ranging discussion, but where we left off, you were in your PhD program, um, and I, I actually owe this question that I'm gonna start with to Roseanne Foddy, Foddy. Um, she told me that when she, she was one of your students, mm -hmm. uh, number two, I think, right? Dissertation? Oh, it could be, yeah, yeah. I yeah I... Um, she didn't know that, but I, I um, so she told me that just as she graduates, she gets her PhD, she goes to Virginia Tech, where she's still employed, and she taught a course, I think it was the History and Systems of Psychology, and one of the assignments was that the students in her class had to do kind of an academic genealogy of a yeah, professor. Yeah, sure. And one of her students picked her, or she picked him, made him pick her or something. Anyhow, the student is working on her. And she listed you as her mentor. Yeah. And so he then, the student, ma mailed you a form, yeah. which you filled out and kindly sent back. And on that form, you listed Herbert si Simon at Carnegie Mellon as having had a significant impact on you. Probably, yeah, uh, sure. So I because there would be people listening to this who don't know who Herbert Simon was. He, he co-won with Alan Newell a Turing Award, uh, 1975, uh, highest distinction in computer science. He followed that with a Nobel Prize in economics. He uh -huh. had a tremendously eclectic interest. Um, together with his wife, he co-published in public administration and cognitive psychology. So here's my question. Did you take a class from him while you were there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. So could you, what was he like? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, he was into the stuff he was teaching in, in great detail. Uh, the basic approach that they took in terms of cognitions was to look at human processes uh, and build fine-grained models of, of what people were doing and, and what the underlying processes were. So you have to get at it in great detail. And uh, to be honest, from a student's perspective, just beginning uh, was kind of boring. Uh, but uh, 
<laughs> it's a good way to do research. Yeah. And as I got further on uh, in my career, I understood better the value of, of doing that kind of stuff and, uh, and uh, the broad perspective that he had. Uh, and, and as a person, he was, he was respectful and you could talk to him and uh, he interacted with faculty and students the same way, you know. So uh, in, in that sense, uh, he was very admirable. So you yourself have amazingly broad interests and some of the, the folks that I talked to to learn about your career said one of the things that you're frequently asked to do is to write an introduction to something because you really have the ability to see the big picture and pull things together. Did, did he influence you in that way or? Uh, I mean, sure. I mean, I mean, a, he was a lot like that. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think I had any uh, attempt to emulate him or anything like that. It's just that uh, uh, he appreciated the fact that he could do that. He could think broadly. Mm -hmm. And he knew what was going on. Uh, like I said, I was a baseball fan, so one time I cut class to go to the World Series in 1968. Uh, and uh, my team lost 10 to 1, and it rained all the time, so that was my punishment. But when I got back and went to class, the first thing he said was, did you enjoy the World Series? You know, and I thought, oh. He knew. He knew, yes. He knew what was going on. So um, it was kind of eye-opening. Um. Someone else who was at Carnegie Mellon when you were there, Alan Newell. Did yeah. Did you work with him at all? No, I didn't. I didn't really work with him. Uh, I'm not a. How should I put it? I'm not a uh, computer scientist in, in any Which stretch of the imagination. Yeah, he excellent. was. Yeah, but so. Um, I mean, I knew who he was. He was at symposium. He he has a book which I think is. A really great book uh, uh, on, I think it's called something like A Unified Theory of Cognitions, but I could have the title wrong, and uh, it's like a 1979 book. And uh, I mean, I've read it m uh, multiple times. It, it's influenced me, uh, so he's a, a really good thinker, uh, sort of, I, what I think is, is kind of the most interesting idea in there is speed accuracy trade-offs. The notion that if you're really an expert in something, I, I, I won't say speed accuracy, speed uh, uh, computation trade-offs is that if you're an expert in something and you have a knowledge base, then you can do the task with much less computational stress. So you can do it faster with less thought. And, uh, and it, it just, the way uh, Simon and Newell can take a knowledge of how people do things and a detailed knowledge of how to represent that and show how it all fits together in, uh, in both the software and also in the human brain is a really important contribution. Did you come away from graduate school with that knowledge, or is this something you picked up later no, reading no, and no, thinking? You, I, and, yeah, I read it afterwards. I mean, the book that I'm talking about wasn't even written right. when I was in graduate yeah. school. So um, did you have any other important mentors when you were in graduate school? Uh, a guy by the name of Terry Gleason, who was uh, uh, taught a lot of quantitative stuff, uh, and I played basketball with him. Not, <laughs> I don't play basketball very well. but. Uh, so uh, uh, he was one. Um, Hans Pennings was there. So at yeah, Carnegie Mellon, it's like they have a lot of great faculty. And uh, it's more like a club than uh, uh, a hierarchy. And so you're in, in the club, and you interact with everybody. And, and, and um, So they, they treated you as something more than just a lowly graduate student. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like a typical Friday, you would be you would have a, a colloquium. You'd have a faculty meeting, a colloquium speaker. Graduate students went to the faculty meetings, a colloquium speaker, a reception. Then they'd go out to dinner. Then there'd be a party, and everybody would go to it. So it was kind of like 
your social life, a big family, uh, uh, and, uh, and people had a common purpose, which was learning and contributing to science. And so that's a, I think it's a great culture to be part of and to contribute to. And you sort of model that in your own career. Yeah, I'm not very original. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not where I, that's not what I meant. I was thinking more of influence rather than lack of originality. But um, I, I mean, the former students that I spoke to described you pretty much the same way. So yeah, but if it works, why do something different? So you you earned your PhD. Um, you accepted a position as an assistant professor. Actually, in 1974, I think it was right yeah, before yeah. you completed your degree at. Uh, University of Akron, and you stay there until 2012. Um, why the University of Akron? I mean, why did you uh, decide to go there? Well, uh, I had a girlfriend who I cared very much about, and she got a job at Buffalo, and it was close. Uh, I could have gone places closer, but it was close enough, uh, and uh, it seemed like a program that was developing. My advisor told me, hey, it's the best one of the options you have, and so, I went, mm -hmm. uh, and stayed there for a variety good, of reasons good, good for a long time. Career there. Um, um, as you look back on all those years you spent at Akron, professionally, what are you proudest of? Oh, that's easy. Uh, I'm proudest of the students that I had mm -hmm. and how well they've done. And you weren't at, uh, at the session where I got an award, but uh, so I just basically read a list of students and thanked them. And uh, yeah, I mean, if if we want to put something on the record, I can I can do the same thing. Uh, it's like so I started out working with Mike Rush and Jim Phillips and Roseanne Foti. Uh, Bruce Avolio was there; uh, was a good friend. Dave Day and Paul Hanges as students. Karen Mayer, who I wrote a book yeah. with, and Karen uh, passed away with brain cancer. And, and my mom was Canadian, and so I, I, for some reason I had a whole string of really great Canadian students. Uh, Doug Brown, Lauren Naidu, uh, Russ Johnson, Chris Salenta. Uh, Russ, I, I put Daisy Chang in with Russ, because mm -hmm. uh, they're, uh, they're a couple. And Ernest Hoffman, Jessica Dinn, Sarah Chandrick, and then I've had great colleagues, so uh, I've been lucky. So you you collaborated actively with your colleagues at Akron? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, 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 well, uh, Ralph Alexander was somebody who was a gifted scholar. He was in the office next to me for 20 years until he died. Uh, and uh, Paul Levy, who was one of Roseanne Foti's graduate students, mm -hmm. his department chair for a number of years when I was there, so. Uh, and, I, and I talked to him yeah. upon your recommendation, so. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, although the next few questions that I'm gonna ask you are actually based on information I got from David Day. Okay. Um, but, and he talked to me about a paper you published in 1977 in, called Implicit Leadership Theory, Potential Threat to the Internal Validity of Leader Behavior Questionnaires, yeah. um, which you co-authored with uh, Rush, Thomas, and yourself. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about your co-authors? Oh, sure. Uh, oh, so when I started, it was kind of interesting because uh, it was 1974, and you had a lot of uh, people who'd been in the military who were coming back and continuing their education, and Mike Rush was one of them. Uh, he was, so he was not that much younger than I was. Uh, he was dedicated to doing good research and willing to challenge uh, uh, ideas as to how you should do it. So uh, we spent a lot of time together. He was a, uh, Good guy, and uh, he since has passed away. So uh, uh, he was a great person to start out working with. Um, and Thomas? Jay Thomas was uh, also a, a smart guy, hard worker. Uh, he wasn't a veteran, but uh, uh, 
it was kind of an oddball in some ways, but uh, <laughs> a good thinker. And I, I mean, both of them were guys you could rely on. They'd, they'd work hard and get stuff right. So uh, it's great, great co-authors. But I mean, you, you have this pattern on your very impressive CV where you tend to publish with your doctoral students. Mm -hmm. Usually it looks like about the time they're getting ready to leave and go out into the world. And then with several of them, there's a gap, and then you're back again. You know? yeah. And I assume that those are the ones that have established themselves. And um, Yeah, well, uh, Akron was a funny place in that we had so many students that they were always kind of struggling just to keep up with your students, that it, it, it would, was difficult when somebody left to have a collaboration that was uninterrupted. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, so, uh, well, I mean, it's just the way it was. The, they, but in, they uh, in your field, though, that, that co-authoring is a part of the mentoring process. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in my field, it would be different if I'm writing a book and it takes six years to write it. I'm not going to have a bunch of co-authors on it. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, for the benefit of the, the, again, the title of the, the piece was "Implicit Leadership Theory: A Potential Threat to the Internal Validity of Leader Behavior Questionnaires." For the benefit of somebody who is going to listen to this, could you explain implicit leadership theory in terms that somebody not in your field could follow the explanation. Sure. Um, you start with the notion that it comes from a behaviorist perspective that what we should do is uh, measure the behavioral styles of leaders and that would be what differentiates one leader from another and allows us to understand how they're perceived and their effect on performance. And uh, to do this, we rely on people who work for that leader to describe his or her behavior. Now, implicit leadership theories are really cognitive structures, belief systems that people have about leadership that they've learned over time or learned through their own experience or maybe uh, through culture and things like that. And when they are asked to rate a behavior, they can do one of a number of things. They can remember a vivid behavior that guides their response. They may know something about the leader and then they sort of integrate it with their implicit theories to come up with a, something that's likely. Mm -hmm. And that's where implicit leadership theories come in. So the point is that ratings may reflect the implicit theories of followers as much or more then they reflect the actual behavior of mm -hmm. leaders. Mm -hmm. And whether it's more or a little bit or, or none at all or uh, the whole story mm -hmm. varies from moment to moment. So we don't know. And then the, uh, the issue of uh, being a threat to the validity, well, the, the question is, what are these measures assessing? Are they assessing what the leader did, what people think the leader did, what they just think about leadership in general. And we don't know. So if the question I'm going to ask you is, is there any way to pull those variables apart and look at them? I mean, is it possible to understand each one of those variables <laughs> yeah, and see yeah. how they work sure. together? Sure. Well, um, we know that Performance information affects descriptions of leaders. That's what we would call inferential uh, processing. Uh, and uh, we know something about the structure of human memory in that uh, typically we think of memory as having three parts, procedural memory, which knowing how to do something like type, uh, episodic memory, which is remembering clear episodes of something, uh, and uh, semantic memory, and I think implicit theories are part of semantic memory. Semantic memory is a general memory. Uh, uh, and so we tap into our general knowledge. Well, what we can do is write and build measures that are more likely to tap into episodic memory. And to do that, uh, you need a 
a clearer, less complicated linguistic structure that asks about specific behaviors. But if it asks about specific behaviors in specific contexts, it may not generalize to other situations. Um, and then I think you should move down to the event level uh, to ask about specific events and what leaders did in a specific event. Mm -hmm. So uh, someone asked me about General Petraeus. Uh, I would say, well, I think of the inter how he behaved in the interview that he just gave an hour ago, mm -hmm. uh, rather than my knowledge of General Petraeus as commander or, or director of the CIA or something mm -hmm. like that, where I, I don't, I have semantic information, but I don't have any episodic information where I was there mm -hmm. and saw it. So uh, Fred Morgison is a good one for looking at to move down to the event level, and, mm -hmm. and, and it can be done. Mm -hmm. You are the developer of implicit leadership theory? No, that's not really true. No, that was a question. Popularizer, <laughs> popularizer of I, it. Okay, I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be bold here. I mean, are you being modest or? No, no. Okay. The first publication was Eden and, and Leviathan okay, in right. uh, 1975. Okay. So uh, I think what we did is we tried to uh, articulate its basis in cognitive and social cognitive processes. When you started to publish in that area, mm -hmm. did you have any difficulty getting your work accepted by? Oh, oh yeah, I told you about that oh, yesterday. Yes. The, the, the Rush Thomas and Lord okay. article, we sent it to JP and got a response that said this is a decrement to the literature and should not be published anywhere. So, and then we went someplace else. It got published and it's been cited. So, part of the way you're looking at leadership is as a process. Absolutely. And that includes the leader and the follower. Right. Um, kind of a symbiotic relationship. Would it be fair for me to conclude, or for a person to conclude, that you were actually looking at followers and their role in the leadership process a long time before followership became fashionable? Probably true, yeah. Uh, I mean, recently the word is uh, crops up all the time. You can't talk about leadership without dropping that word in, but it really seems to me that you and your colleagues were working in that area decades ago. Yep. Um, uh, followers in terms of, uh, well, leadership perceptions are perceptions of followers. Mm -hmm. So when you work in that area, you have to look at followers. and. Uh, we start out with looking group behavior. Group behavior involves followers. And then uh, if you pay attention to motivational and self-regulatory processes and later on identity as a construct that ties those all together, um, those are all follower-based constructs. So yeah. So looked at through the lens of implicit leadership theory, How does one identify or explain successful leadership? How do we know if it works? Well, uh, you have to look at social outcomes. You have to look at uh, performance outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I just came from this talk by General Petraeus, and he'll go back to Iraq and say that, you know, their surge was successful because uh, Deaths went down 85 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an objective measure. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, and you can count it. So measures where you have things that you can count uh, are good. Social perceptions are good in some instances, if that's what your focus is. Um, and leadership both involves uh, perceptual processes and then what leaders do. And they have to have, they have, to have the perceptions that they're leaders and effective to have much leverage in changing things. This is going to sound cynical, and I don't mean it to, to come out that way, but um, as I read work in this general area, one of the things that occurs to me is that somebody could read this stuff and conclude that leadership is about managing your image. Um, yeah, it could be, and, and that's part of leadership. Mm -hmm. but. 
it's, that's not the whole story. Uh, you manage your image so that uh, people perceive you as a leader, and some people do that very well. But that's kind of the surface structure. The, the deeper structure is, do you understand what you're doing? Do you understand the policy implications of the strategies you develop? Do you understand the people that you're working with and uh, the fact that, that they have lives that they're trying to lead in, uh, in a way that's satisfying and uh, allows them to grow and develop? And do you help that process? So uh, at multiple levels, you have to have an understanding that goes beyond your image and a willingness to, to do something and persist in it. Because, uh, you know, a mistake in terms of leadership is to think that, well, leaders just do something and it works out. I mean, it, it doesn't. And you have to do it again and again and pay attention to details. And then you try, you try and have change. It's always backsliding. Then you have to sort of em emphasize it again. So it's a process that you have to stick with. How do charismatic leaders fit into your view of leadership? Uh, they're charismatic because of the way followers interpret them and the reaction that they have on followers. Uh, I think that some of them are only charismatic rep retrospectively uh, rather than prospectively. Um, and so when you lump together people's memories of what's happened and, wh and what the outcomes were and the person and their involvement, someone becomes charismatic that uh, when you talk to them face to face, you may not have seen it that way. Mm. How, how about demagogues? How do they fit into the way you understand leadership? Uh, I, I have never really thought about it that much, <laughs> to be honest. Okay. I suppose they're extreme examples in terms of charisma, but uh, I just sidestep. I don't have a good answer for that question. Well, um, so again, David Day told me that the article cited implicit leadership theory of potential threat to internal validity of leader behavior questionnaires that you and your co-authors employed the performance cue effect to demonstrate that leadership behavior description questionnaires that were in standard use had limitations. Yeah. And because they were in such widespread use, and I assume still are. Yep. Um, what, as I understand it, basically the responses to the questionnaires were significantly but unintentionally impacted by the cues provided by the researcher. Yep. So did you set out trying to find out if, there, if these questionnaires were flawed or did you stumble into this? I mean, what was the research problem that you were working on in this piece? I oh, like I was telling you, uh, uh, yesterday uh, I got this 1975 issue of OBHDP, it came in the mail, I took it home, laid down on my orange <laughs> shag carpet and started looking through it and saw this article by Barry Staw and so I read this and I said, whoa, this, is, uh, this puts it, the research that we're doing in a completely new light. He didn't do it with respect to leadership. He did it with respect to group processes in general. Uh, but I said, we, can, we could do that. And so the typical process is, you know, you don't get this idea just like that. You say, this is a great article. So then you go tell your graduate students to read it. And then you discuss it. And then you say, well, and maybe they have an idea, uh, this, uh, since Russia's first author, it was probably his idea, that we put this together and design a study and e examine it. And then it turned out to be a productive area because lots of people didn't want to believe this. And so they say, yes, but it doesn't happen if they have behavioral information. And so then we do another, another study and say, yeah, it does happen. And uh, it doesn't happen in this circumstance. And so. We do another study and say, yeah, it does happen in this circumstance. And it's like, it's an area where everybody can raise objections and you can do studies and they, uh, it always works. So, I mean, for a young researcher to have a paradigm that always works is nice. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so it was just a productive area to do research in at that time. So, I mean, one of the things that, that I talked to with David Day about was that He said basically that the conclusions that you arrived at in this piece were largely ignored by your colleagues. Yeah, your yeah, sure. Um, why do you think that was? Inconvenient. It's like, why are we ignoring climate change? It's an inconvenient <laughs> truth. It's gonna, it's there, it's going on, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's, it's disruptive to your everyday functioning to, to recognize that what you're doing is not right or it's harmful. It has, uh, I'm thinking more of climate change yeah. than, than these instruments. And so people don't wanna, don't wanna do that. They wanna keep doing what they've done that's been successful for them. And I'm, the reason that I'm pursuing this is because I understand that, that this instrument is still widely used pretty much in the way that you criticized it. Um, well, yes and no. So, so it was a criticism of the leader behavior description questionnaire, right. uh, which is an okay measure. I mean, uh, I think it works in, in retrospect because people, uh, according to Cuddy, Fisk, and Glick, encode social information on two dimensions, warmth and competence and this dealt with consideration and initiating structure. So people could go right from their perceptions of how warm and competent someone was to fill out a questionnaire about whether they were considerate and uh, how much structure they initiated. Or and they probably went, causality went both ways. But um, so a lot of that research stopped with the LBDQ after that era. So uh, it did have an effect on that instrument, but then people came out with the notion of transformational leadership and Bernie Bass had his uh, uh, um, multi-factor leadership questionnaire. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bernie and uh, Bruce Avolio did an article in uh, the ed Educational and Psychology, Psychological Measurement, I think it was 1979. Mm -hmm that looked at the MLQ to see if it was susceptible to performance Q effects. And uh, their conclusion was, uh, well, no, if you used a forced choice format, it wasn't. But about 80, 90% of the variance was associated with leadership prototypes. So if I looked at their article, I'd say it's the same thing. But because it's a different instrument, a different idea, the people got on the bandwagon that this was a a great way to go. It wasn't until uh, Van Nippenberg and Sitkin in 2013 really har harshly is a nice word, uh, harshly criticized the MLQ that I think the careful readers say, hey, maybe a lot of this literature isn't as good as we think it was. But it's the same problem. MLQ. Multi-factor le multi leadership questionnaire. Okay. So, so that was really, the last piece you mentioned was really calling a lot of the work that Bernie Bass and other people developed into question. Yeah, the, the Van Nippenberg and Sitkin article says, yeah. let's toss this out and uh, start again. But uh, I will say one thing that we're doing is that we have done some research with the MLQ, and we use this technique that uh, cognitive scientists use to uh, ask people to reflect when they fill out an item, whether it's based on a vivid recollection, episodic memory, or semantic memory. And so we've done that, and we've taken the MLQ apart and reformed it into scales that are primarily episodic mm -hmm. versus scales that are primarily semantic. Mm -hmm. And when we put them together, the episodic items always predict better. Oh. Okay, and we don't know if it's item specific or whether it's you're tapping into a different process. But so that's kind of hopeful in terms of measurement. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're trying to explore that in, uh, diff with different measures. So that's your current 
research, this current research Whitney, that we're yes. doing. Yeah, okay. we would be me and Tiffany Hansbro and Roseanne Foti and uh, uh, Berka Chins. Mm -hmm. So in 1986, you published a piece called The Meta-Analysis of the Relation Between Personality Traits and Leadership Perceptions and Application of mm -hmm. Validity Generalization Procedures uh, with Christy DeVader. DeVader. And Allinger. Yeah, George Allinger. Yeah, uh, Journal of Applied Psychology. So DeVader was one of your doctoral students. Yes. And Allinger? He was one of my doctoral students, too. Yeah, okay. Um, so. What I wanted to, to talk to you about was your use of meta-analysis. Okay. Um, so far as I could tell, that was the first piece that you published where you used meta-analysis. Yeah. Um, because I'm, I didn't read everything you wrote, obviously, but. Sure. Um, so how did you become interested in doing that? What, what attracted you to that methodology? Oh, well, a, a good fortune, really. I was in a, in a program where we covered the field broadly and uh, so I'll tell you exactly what happened. I was grading comps, which are, you know, PhD students have to, after three years, they have to answer broad questions uh, in like a two day, two days of their life that they'll always remember but would like to forget. I remember mine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, I just graded like 12 answers on meta-analysis. And uh, then I, I got to a question on leadership and uh, the fact that there's variability of results in terms of uh, how things like intelligence relate to outcomes. And uh, after reading this, and the key about meta-analysis is that is the argument is that when you're doing research, you're sampling from a population, and each different sample is going to be a little bit different, so that's going to introduce variability in terms of what your findings are, but if you can find a way to aggregate across those different samples, you can get an estimate of the population value. And so I looked at this uh, area of leadership research, which was done by a guy by the name of Floyd Mann and published in 1959. And uh, Mann's conclusion about leadership and intelligence was simply that there's too much variability there. We can't, there's, there's generally a positive relationship, but there's variability in the values. And you know, I looked at that and I said, ah, it's a meta-analysis issue. It's, you know, it's just sampling variability. And so then again, you, you gotta find students who uh, see, the students would have taken courses where they covered meta-analysis. I never had a course in meta-analysis, but I had the idea. So I said, hey, what do you guys think about this? And um, they thought it was a good idea, and they dug and got the literature and did the meta-analysis, and we got it published. And uh, um, then it sort of changed the way people thought about traits and leadership in the leadership field. So then after that, you have a lot of meta-analyses being applied. So how, to how did leadership. it change the way people, because that's where I really wanted to go with this, is how did it change the way people, which would be scholars in your field, thought about traits and leadership? Well, they, start, they started doing meta-analyses. Mm -hmm. and, and so then you find, yeah, there are traits that are associated with leadership, but you have to keep in mind that most of the dependent variables they looked at were of the perceptual nature. So we know that traits are associated with the way people are perceived as leaders. You know, which is, wh what causes what isn't quite but clear all the time. The idea that traits were influential had sort of fallen out of favor. Absolutely. Yeah, and you, I mean, in this piece, the, the power of the piece is that it reintroduced it back into the conversation. Absolutely. So uh, just again, for the benefit of people who are using this and you concluded in your piece, trait theories have not been seriously considered by leadership researchers since Mann and Stodgill, uh, reported that no traits consistently differentiated leaders from non-leaders across a variety of situations. The thesis of this article is that these reviews have often been misinterpreted, and then you went on to, to make that mm -hmm. argument. So um, would it be reasonable for somebody who's not in your field to conclude that this really was a game changer in terms of Yeah, yeah, it would be, it would uh -huh. be. 
-hmm. yeah. Reintroduce the idea of trades playing. Um, so you identified masculinity, femininity as personality traits associated with leadership perceptions mm -hmm. in this piece. So what would you, your identifying and validating that trait uh, say, if anything, about the differences and similarities between men and women seeking to fill leadership roles? Well, it says a lot. Um, it's what it tells you is that, and one of the things that the reviewers asked us to do, and it was a good thing in that article, is to draw the parallels between people's implicit theories and between um, the dimensions in our meta-analyses. And so the masculinity, femininity comes out in terms of meta-analysis, but it also comes out in terms of people's uh, implicit theories mm -hmm. as being a dimension. And what that means is that if people don't think carefully about leadership, that they can more rapidly access leadership constructs and use them to make sense of behavior if the target is a, a male than if it's a female. And so um, Kirsten Scott and Doug Brown uh, have a great article where it shows that exactly that, that if you show people an agentic behavior of a female leader, they have a, a latency in encoding it that's greater than if you show them the same behavior uh, for a male target. And, 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 I mean, I say show them, they didn't really show them that. They, it was a, a written study. But we're just slower to encode information that's in, con, inconsistent with implicit theories. And, and you have to encode it more effortfully or it's gone. So it's, so it's an inherent bias against yeah. women. You know, it's, it's there, you can't deny it. So, what kind of an impact would that information, or should that information have on, say, leadership training? Well, that's really an inter uh, interesting question because you can approach it in two ways. You can say, well, we need to change society, we need to have equal opportunity, we need to change our culture so that there's more opportunity for women as leaders. And we should do that, it's critically important that we do do that. But for a particular leader, you know, a, a specific female who wants to be a leader and has the other capacities, changing society is not a good recommendation. You wanna know, well, what can you do to overcome this? Mm -hmm. And so, behaving in ways that are decisive that are show intelligence, that fit with other aspects of implicit theories, so people access the leadership construct with respect to you. Those, those are things that you can control as a leader. Also, this is a really interesting finding that uh, I think has a lot of importance. We did a study where we uh, altered camera angles, and so we viewed the same person saying the same thing, either in a way that made them in the center of your visual screen or a little bit to the side. And so when you show people this, these in different groups of people, these two conditions, people who saw the person in the center of your visual screen gave higher leadership ratings to that person. And they saw them as being more causal, even though people saw the same thing. Uh, it's, it's what's called the salience effect. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think the advice to female leaders is do things that make you more salient, Vis visually. You know, don't sit if you can stand. Uh, tr I mean, it's kind of like the image man management stuff that you talked about. You want to be prominent, you don't want to be uh, hesitant about things. Um, so because this, this comes up from time to time, that's not the same as telling women that to be successful they have to act like men. No, it's not saying that you have, it's not saying you have to be masculine. Yeah. It's saying there's, there's this bias against you mm -hmm. and so you have to find ways to overcome it. Mm -hmm. 
and there are ways in terms of emphasizing behavior that fits with prototypes or in terms of uh, being salient and, uh, uh, and a, a assertive. So I think that, that those are uh, strategies that will work for a specific individual. So I'm going to skate out on a thin ice here, but I, I can do that. Um, so you referenced uh, Mann, published in 1959, and Stog Stoggle, S-T-O-G-D-I-L-L, -L, published in 1948. Yeah. Um, when they did their research and published, they couldn't possibly have had much access to any computing capability. No, no. So was your medicine, meta-analysis of trait theories an attempt to apply science to what had up to then had been largely a qualitative examination? No, I wouldn't say it had been largely qualitative. I mean, they uh, used measures of personality. They correlated personality measures with outcomes. They just didn't have an understanding of sampling error and what it does to population estimates, the way uh, uh, Schmidt and Hunter's meta-analysis uh, work uh, informed us about. And they didn't have the software to run meta-analyses either. I remember using a volume that was to generate random samples. It was called 100,000 random numbers and so many normal deviates, and it was just this big book that we had to go to to yeah. generate random samples. Yeah, yeah, now it would be just done by computer program. So, um, before I, I let this go, and given that people who listen to this or read this are likely not to be in your field, could you kind of give a layperson's explanation of what meta analysis is? I think it would be sure. better coming it's from a, you than me trying. It's a technique so. that takes data from uh, re data on results from various samples or different studies and weights it by the number of people in the particular sample. So you give more weight to uh, the larger samples and uses it to estimate the likely population uh, estimate of for the variable that you're trying to look at. So it's, a, it's just a way of accumulating results across studies to get a better uh, estimate of what the true value of something is. And we call it a population parameter rather than a sample parameter. And uh, of course, the thing is, not every study that's done gets published, so you have to find it's how you get that, the studies that you look at, which is a, really a critical issue, and that is, do you get all the doctoral dissertations that weren't published? Do you get the uh, studies that were rejected? And you have to, so as well as looking at what's published, you have to write people and uh, try all kinds of things to get these uh, other studies so you have a better estimate. So the universe that you're analyzing is other people's work? Absolutely. So, and then you, in, in effect, by engaging in this in meta-analysis can, uh, can take advantage of the cumulative information that's in all of those studies and very likely could come to conclusions that are quite different than the original authors. I mean, I'm could thinking be. of Alice, yeah. Alice Egley, who you, you co-authored with, right? 20, yeah. 2017, um, did some really interesting work on the published sex of researchers and sex type communications by doing meta-analysis. Yeah, absolutely. And she was looking for something that wasn't really there to begin with and came to some amazing conclusions. So, yeah. And that's sort of what you did, wasn't it? I mean, yeah. not with sex types, but yeah. Yeah, yeah well, Alice's stuff is really interesting because, um, you know, you find that females tend to be more transformational than males. Okay, that's one of her meta-analysis findings. Another finding, which is worth uh, uh, pointing out, is a lot of people say that organizations perform better if they have a better representation of minorities and, and women on the board. Alice finds that's not true uh, from meta-analytic research. So um, 
it's accumulating research is kind of objective, uh, if, if the studies are objective, and it'll lead you to conclusions that uh, maybe are different than you would get otherwise. Um, so I'm gonna switch to an, another one of your publications as a way to talk about your evolving thinking on leadership. 1991, you published a book we've already talked about in, in passing co-authored this book with Karen Mayer, Leadership and Information Processing, Linking Perceptions and Organizational Performance. Uh, she was one of your doctoral students. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I didn't read the whole thing, but I, I read as much as I had time for, and at one, at one point you said, at this point, we should distinguish between the constructs of leadership and management. We, con we conceptualize leadership as resulting from social perceptual process. The essence of leadership is being seen by others as by, as a leader by others. So, what is the connection between cultural context and this view of leadership that you express here? Oh, I, mean, I think it's we're, just, in, it's, the, it's we're just, in a foreign just, country. Yeah, and, it's a strong connection. Uh, different cultures will have different views of what characteristics define a good leader and lead to good outcomes in their culture. And uh, we, we talked about it in, when we started in terms of evolutionary theory right. and then linguistic theory uh, would suggest that people are good at encoding into language the aspects of social behavior that lead to successful outcomes in their particular culture. So that if we look at, for example, uh, leadership in China, paternalistic leadership is an important kind of of leadership, we don't see much of that in the U.S. You might see some in some uh, European countries, but probably it's not common. But uh, uh, so different cultures have different beliefs, and they have different social organizations, different industrial organizations, and so uh, leadership is culture specific. So if we're going to successfully educate people to be leaders, does that have to be rooted in the culture? Well, I, sure, uh, in the sense that it doesn't have to be rooted in the culture. Well, yeah, let me back up. They need to know how their culture functions and be able to function in that culture. Mm -hmm. But then when they go to a different culture, they need to be aware of the differences. Mm -hmm. And um, moving to a different culture trips people up often. Mm -hmm. uh, ben Shaw has an article that takes categorization theory uh, and applies it to difficulties that people have with cross-cultural leadership movements. Uh, and it's probably like a 1990 article, mm -hmm. something like that. So you then went on to say that, you know, based on this logic, we define leadership as a process of being perceived by others as a leader. The locus of leadership is not solely in a leader or solely in the followers, instead it involves behaviors, traits, characteristics, outcomes produced by leaders as these elements are interpreted by others. And I kind of already asked you this, but I want to put this in, in, in one place. If leadership is a process of being perceived by others as a leader, then does that encourage leaders to put their efforts into managing perceptions? Or should it encourage leaders to put their efforts into managing perceptions? Uh, I think good leaders do that. And th uh, th that's not all they do, but uh, that's part of it. Um, managing perceptions gives you more social power. That increases what Hambrick and Finkelstein call the latitude of discretion in terms of the policies that you can implement. So if you want to have people accept and follow your policy uh, beliefs, then uh, you need to be perceived as a leader. Mm -hmm. Now, it may also be that that's not the best approach towards leadership, and what you really want to do is catalyze things so that uh, ideas and structures emerge from followers. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
That's, that's a different take on leadership. It's uh, more complexity theory and less hierarchical leadership. So uh, image management may help in your career in the short run. I'm not sure that it's gonna help society and the leadership field uh, in general in the long run. So we talked about the fact about leadership being a cultural construction, but is leadership situational? Sure. Um, in, in what way would you describe leadership? Situation? Because leaders have to deal with events. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think when we understand leadership, we want to move it up to the level of the person. But what happens in terms of specific events is situational. So uh, uh, how, okay, I'm gonna pick Trump. How <laughs> Trump manages the hurricane disaster in Puerto Rico, that's a specific event. Uh, and it's situational. He's got to, to manage the relief process or put somebody in charge who can manage the relief process but he also has to manage the perceptions. And I don't think he did a very good job when he went down to Puerto Rico of managing perceptions in, in a way that's in his favor. And let's hope that the federal government has done a better job of managing the relief process. But it's event specific. It, you know, it deals with Puerto Rico because Puerto Rico's different than Florida. You can't have all of these electricity companies from the rest of the US move their trucks into to Puerto Rico the way they did in Florida. Right. Um, so again, the, the, the same article you, you said, uh, further leadership processes are merely a specific example of more general social cognitive processes that continually occur in everyday life. So <coughs> I'd like to get you to talk about that. Because um, I think what you're doing there is connecting leadership society in which the leader exists. But um, could you talk a little bit more about how leadership processes are merely a specific example of more general social cognitive processes that occur? Sure. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, I'm drawn on the work that Carl Weick has done on sense making. Mm -hmm. you, people have to make sense all the time of where they are in a particular physical space, social space, task space, and, and their own personal history and their capabilities. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, well, I mean, that, that's a story. They do it drawing on their emotional responses, their experience, the cognitive structures they have, uh, and their perception of what's going on at Mm -hmm. particular moment. Now, here's the important thing. When they make sense of it and look backwards, they see a lot more certainty than actually existed when they were trying to put all the pieces together. So like for example, uh, Steve Jobs says, well you can connect all the dots but only looking backwards. So. Uh, so, and leadership is part of that process. But that's sort of part of the process of being human, right? We make sense out of the world Absolutely. in which we live and it's easier to do in hindsight. Yep, exactly. Um, but I, I mean, would one be correct in concluding that you're really saying that leadership is a part of the fabric of society in which it exists and you can't pull, pull it apart? That, that's right, I mean, that's a complexity theory argument that, you know, uh, if you start pulling various aspects apart and taking an analytic approach, you lose something. Now, how far you can do that uh, is an interesting question for science mm -hmm. to deal with. Is that a question you've wrestled with in your own work? No, I don't really deal with big questions. I just sort of <laughs> focus on true. what I'm doing That's at the true. moment. <laughs> That's not true. Um, all right. So, in chapter 11, which is entitled CUSP, C-U-S-P, yeah, yeah. Catastrophe Model of Organizational yeah. Performance, David Day actually kind of coached me through this chapter, so I thank him and, and I'm responsible for any conclusions that are in error, but 
He pointed out that in that chapter and elsewhere in the book that you and Karen Mayer employ nonlinear dynamics and chaos theory to address issues of how perceptions change from one state to another. Yeah. Um, Day believed that you were influenced by theoretical physics and its consideration of how matter changes from one state to another. So let me back up now. Using nonlinear dynamics and chaos theory to address how issues of perceptions change from one state to another. That's part of understanding leadership. I assume it's also part of understanding society. But is that what you were doing there? No, no. no. Dave is, uh, he's giving me too much credit. Um, when we wrote that, we were largely thinking in terms of dynamic systems theory but not theoretical physics. Okay. Uh, in, in terms of how systems can shift from one attractor to another. And the notion of an attractor is an important idea. It's a point of stability in some sort of space. Uh, so uh, this room and this interview process is a point, it's an attractor. It's something that I'm comfortable with and knew about and could gravitate towards. Uh, relatively easily after I'd done it the first time. And so what happens in, uh, in social perceptions is we use constructs that we're familiar with, they're accessible to make sense of things. And uh, when we shift from one attractor to another, it's a catastrophe in terms of, it's a radical shift that changes perceptions. Um, now, I learned about catastrophe theory from Ralph Alexander, who's one of my colleagues, and he really understood it a whole lot better than me. And then we've done a few studies that use it uh, in Paul Hanges, who's, he did his master's with me, his PhD with Ralph. He's the one that sort of moved that along and has educated me in the process. But so it's a mathematical way to represent both stability and radical change in the same system. And it's called catastrophe theory because that radical change is, a, likely, to is a catastrophe. likely to be a catastrophe. Yeah, it's a switch in attractors. So for example, we did a study uh, which has never been published. I think it should have been, but um, we, we, Paul Hanges and uh, Dave Day and I, uh, built tapes that had nine episodes in them and could be viewed in either order. And what changed across the nine episodes was the proportion of activities, of leadership activities that were done by males versus females, okay? Mm -hmm. So people saw a four-person group interacting and they saw snippets of this over time. And so what happens is it's a catastrophe when someone shifts, I'm careful about my wording here, from a female leader to a male leader, and they're switching to a different attractor. And the same thing happens when they switch in the opposite direction. And so what we found is that people delay the switch, okay? And so and even though there's a linear change, they stick with their first impression longer than they should, and then all of a sudden jump to a new reality, a new interpretation but they delay longer when you're going from male to female than when you're going from female to male. And so that switch is harder for people to make perceptually, and it's especially hard for people who had strong gender biases. So is it likely that, that men would have a harder time making the switch than women? Yep, and, um, but that's a, that's a demographic. What's really uh, uh, the driver is whether they had uh, traditional sex role stereotypes, uh, you know. And so part of the research is to try to measure that? As yeah, well, yes. to measure that and, and other factors that affect the nature of this change and uh, like need for cognitive closure would be another one. People who want certainty are less able to shift. Okay, so one of the things that David was 
really wanted me to ask you, and you may have already answered this, was were you in fact integrating theory incorporating information from physics to explain how perceptions change from one state to another? Not at that time. Okay. 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 All right. We got into the physics stuff a little bit later on, which is an interesting story. We're going we're gonna to talk about that. <laughs> okay. So, um, control theory. Um, a large part of your reputation as a scholar is based on your use of control theory of motivation. Um, number one, could you give a layperson's explanation of what that is? And number two, does that have any direct connection to leadership? Yeah, sure, both. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, control theory, it, it's easiest to understand if you think of a thermostat. Okay. okay. You have a standard. Uh, which could be temperature or uh, uh, could be a goal that people set. Mm -hmm. And you maintain that standard of, and you respond to inconsistencies. So maybe uh, it's sunny and the temp uh, or it's cold and the room gets cooler and so the thermostat says there's a discrepancy and it turns on the heating system. And it resolves the discrepancy, and then things stop. Well, that's kind of a model of motivation, but it's more compl complicated because people have goals, and they may continually raise their goals, uh, and they pursue those goals <clears throat> uh, through motivated behavior and strategies that they have. And uh, if they make, excuse me, uh, good progress, they keep the goals. If they make slow progress or no progress, they lower the goals. So it's a cybernetic theory, but what's changing is both the behavior and the standards that you're trying to achieve, but they do it in different time frames. Behavior changes in the very short run. Goals change in a little bit longer run. Now, how does it tie into leadership? Leaders inspire people to set goals and to persist. And so if you convince your followers that, have, that they have the ability to do great things, they will persist longer mm -hmm. before they lower their goals than if they think they're no good and they have no skill. Uh, so leaders can have that effect on goals and that can have an effect on people's mm -hmm. persistence with goals and then they can have effects on the way they interpret success or failure. Um, so, so that's the basic model. I, if you go further into the process, what happens when you set goals is that information associated with competing goals is harder to access. And so people are able to stay focused. Mm -hmm. And what allows them to stay focused, and you get into the neuropsychology, is a dopamine-based gating system that means that their mind will focus on the information that's related to goals as long as they anticipate success. And that's what triggers the release of dopamine. It's yeah. the anticipation of success. So when you get discouraged, you can't focus, and you're easily distracted. Huh. So when I talked to Paul Levy, he told me that the intellectual roots of control theory actually came from the field of engineering. Yeah, that's true. Can you, again, sort of explain for the benefit of lay people who are going to listen to this where, you, where that came from, how, the, how you well, connect the dots? En engineers build control systems, like uh, uh, a thermostat would right. be a control system. So, uh, and, and a, a lot of the uh, criticism of the area came from the mechanical analogy. You know, it's, it's the way mechanical systems work, and it's the way that human behavior does the same thing that mechanical systems do, but it does it in a much more sophisticated and variable manner. Uh, people don't always persist. They don't always achieve what they set out to do. 
uh, in high reliability, high reliability systems, they work all the time when engine when good engineers and, and uh, they're also perfectly logical, which people yeah are exactly not people are not. So um, so there's there's that difference, and you've got to recognize it. But the principles are there. So are you the one who connected those areas? Con that control theory is your theory, right? No, I, other people have have uh, have done it first. Uh, I kind of made it more popular and did a couple studies. Uh, and this was a long time ago. This was a late '90s, uh, and I can't really think of the off the top of my head of the okay. person's name, or I'd give it to you. Another thing that Pauline Powers. Okay. Powers. Okay. Powers. Okay. Yes. So you built upon his work, were Absolutely. inspired by his work? Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. So Levy also told me that, and some of the other people with whom I spoke, that you had trouble initially getting your work based on control theory published in referee journals. Uh, well, sure. Um, there was kind of a debate between goal-setting theorists and control theorists, and it was good for the discipline. Uh, but. Basically, we're, we're saying the same thing, that people set goals and pursue goals, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that you need feedback, or goals, goal setting won't work. And so, uh, egos get involved. <laughs> That's the best way to put it. <laughs> that happens. All right, so in 2007, mm -hmm. we moved to Durham. Yeah. Um, before we talk about Durham, is there anything that you want to mention about your time at Akron that I didn't ask you? Because I sort of skipped over that. Oh, uh, I mean, you certainly developed a, a program there that, that had a very high national profile. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, people don't just do research, they have lives. Yeah. And my kids were born in Akron, and they stayed in Akron, and uh, I stayed in Akron as long as they were there. Mm -hmm. And it was a good mm -hmm. place for me. Uh, it was important for me uh, to be close to them, and uh, still is, but they both grew up, uh, went elsewhere, had jobs, and, uh, and then I was retired, and I was more free to do other things, and uh, my, my daughter Nicole's in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and my son is in uh, Minneapolis, and they're both happy, and uh, one's married, one's not, but they both have partners and good jobs, and so it's, it was a time when uh, I felt comfortable in doing something else. So you really had had one full career and a pretty full life yeah. in Akron. Yeah. Um, I understand that you retired and then they hired you back for a few years to yeah, teach your courses. Yeah, that's true. So you yeah. were really not prepared to actually retire. Um. No, yeah, it was just a, a good deal. And what can I say? I'm not stupid. You get a good deal, you take a good deal. <laughs> oh, no, that's and, not where I was going with that. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, yeah. it, it is hard to stop. And, yeah. Um, but you did make a decision to move to Durham in 2007, and you're still there. Yeah. Um, what attracted you to Durham? I mean, if you were going to go somewhere, why did you go there? <laughs> uh, circumstance and, uh, and um, well, first of all, Durham is sort of seen as being one of the great universities in the world, especially by the British, uh, and especially by people <laughs> in, in uh, Durham. Uh, so, so uh, that's kind of cool. Uh, whether it's true is debatable, um, but s some people believe that. But in terms of goal setting, you, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, that's right. a good one. Uh, but in, in terms of mechanics, I, I didn't know much about Durham. Uh, I was just at a conference, and I was at a poster session, and poster sessions are where people present papers on a bulletin board and they stand around and talk to people. So I was talking to somebody, and uh, Birgit Chins came up to the same poster session, because she does stuff in implicit leadership theories too. And I had met her the day before, 
And so I just started talking to her and she was telling me about Durham and she loves her job and uh, they're looking for people. And I said, well, I might be available. And I was just kind of joking, but she didn't see it as that way. And, and I had already uh, agreed to, to do a paper at a conference in Sheffield. And so uh, she said, well, if you're going to Sheffield, come visit us. And come visit us can be mm -hmm. a very seductive phrase, I guess. And so uh, both my wife and I did, and uh, we went to Durham. We gave, she says, I'll organize a talk. And I said, yeah, okay, sure. Um, so we gave talks, and they offered us jobs on the spot. And we said, uh, we'll think about it. But we negotiated something that was acceptable, and we went home and thought about it. And me more than I think my wife, who um, continually reminds me of this, uh, thought, well, yeah, why not? And uh, so when we went, we thought it'd just be for a year or two, and it has extended beyond uh, a couple years, and probably extend uh, into, into the future, but then we're kind of moving back and forth between two continents because our family is in the U.S. and we're in the U.K. So uh, there are challenges, but it's largely been a good move. And you're a uh, professor of management, Durham Business School, and director mm -hmm. of International Center for Leadership and Followership. Um, so as I look at your career <laughs> from the, through the eyes of a humanist, I mean, you're, you're best known as a scientist, theoretical scholar, and one of the things you do at Durham is, is work with uh, MBA students, executive MBA, who I probably couldn't imagine really being too interested in theory and really uh, very interested in getting a high-paying job. Um, how does the scientist and the theoretical scholar match up with the MBA students? Well, MBA students, uh, and executive MBA students are students, first of all, so that they, they don't mind scholarship. Mm -hmm. uh, they're pretty bright, motivated mm -hmm. people, and so they'll work hard and read this stuff. But I also don't spend much time teaching MBA students, and I okay. don't teach MBA students anymore. Uh, okay. I spend most of my time working with other faculty and, and doctoral students there, which is kind of what I've done mm -hmm. all my career. It, people, it's an attractor, you know? It's like you gravitate to the same kinds of things. So the, the International Center for Leadership and Followership, what's that all about? What, what does it do and what do you do there? Oh, well, basically, what I do there is solve problems. Uh, <laughs> with a lot of people, uh, there, there's obviously gonna be problems. in uh, Europe's different than the U.S. and there's more movement of people from one institution to another. and uh, uh, That's always a challenge, keeping the faculty that you have and attracting new faculty, so I, I help in that respect, both directly and, and in all honesty, uh, symbolically. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea there is uh, pretty simple, to build a world-class uh, leadership center mm -hmm. where people want to come there to study leadership, to do leadership research, to engage in leadership practice. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we're able to do that. We've convinced a lot of other people to come. Durham has a great advantage. They have this cathedral that is phenomenal. It was built, started in like 980 and completed in like 1120 or something like that. So you can just take people into this cathedral and they say, holy mackerel, you know, and uh, they're wowed and they walk away and they have images of a celestial connection or something, I don't know, <laughs> but, uh, and it's a beautiful city. People like being there. Um, the weather isn't ideal, but <clears throat> Uh, people don't realize that in the short run, so people come. And you, but you also in the center have a cohort of colleagues, right? Exactly. Who are interested in this same general area of study, and which maybe for the first time in your professional career, you've had that many colleagues in one place. Who? Uh, yeah, uh, that's probably true. Uh, but it doesn't. 
I, it's great, and I, I really value the colleagues that I have, but it doesn't matter so much anymore because you've got the internet, you can Skype with people, et cetera. You know, so you really can be connected all over the world. But um, uh, it is a great group of people, and we meet every week and have lunch, and new ideas come up, and uh, uh, students are from all over the world, which mm -hmm. is an adjustment for me a bit. Uh, and uh, so th they have different backgrounds and different ways of thinking. And uh, so it's, it's a bit of a challenge that you discover as you move along. It's not something that you're aware of until uh, things that you did before don't seem to be working quite the same way and you figure out why. Well, but having that diversity of humanity is a little bit like a leadership laboratory, isn't it? I mean, people bring different perspectives to the yeah, situation. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Um, so, you've been a scholar and a teacher for a long time, mm -hmm. and we reached the age when many people retire, and, 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 and I'm in the same boat, I'm not gonna retire, so. Um, you have remained productive and engaged and continue to push boundaries, and one of the things that fits into that category is the example of an article that I've been dying to talk to you about, which is a quantum approach to time and organizational change, which you co-authored with Jessica Din and E. Hoffman? Ernest Hoffman. Ernest yeah. Hoffman, uh, in the Academy of Management Review in 2015. So I note that, that both Din and Hoffman were graduate students of yours, but um, can you talk about the genesis of a quantitative approach to time and organizational change. I mean, you are attempting to integrate physics into your analysis at this point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure, so you say, how did I get the idea? Well, I was watching TV, you know, and I was watching this program on PBS called Nova, oh, yeah. and, and Brian Green was talking about it. And I thought, wow, this is pretty interesting. And so Brian Greene is a writer as well as being a physicist, and he has a couple, maybe three now, books. Uh, and so I, I got, got his book, I read his book, and I thought, oh, this is pretty interesting. So I bought a couple more copies, and I gave one to Jessica and Ernest. I said, here, go read this. Mm -hmm. So we talk about it, and uh, then uh, uh, we thought we'd write a review paper, and it goes, went through four reviews, but they were really pretty encouraging, and it got published. So, what is unique about theoretical physics yeah. that has anything to do with leadership? Well, it's the notion, and it's debated by physicists, but it's called the Copenhagen Interpretation. Uh, and it's from the early uh, 1900s, and it's an interpretation that Einstein, Einstein would not agree with, but it's the notion that things can exist in a state, they, they, that they can, that an electron can travel as a wave, it's in multiple places at once, and reality can have multiple aspects at the same time uh, that we only are conscious and aware of one that we experience, and in physics it would be the position that they measure. But so we've extended the idea to a broader perspective. And what they call a superposition state, we call a superpotentiality state. And it's the notion that all the time, there are many alternative possibilities that could occur. They have a certain probability of occurring, and only one happens. But the others were out there at some point in time. So I gave the example of how I got to Durham. I could have been standing at a different poster session, because a few minutes before and a few minutes afterwards, I was at different poster boards, and never met Birgit, and I'd never be in Durham. I might be someplace else. So there were alternative potentials for me. 
And there always are alternative potentials. But once something happens, it is the one that defines reality for you. So that when you look backwards at your life's history, it seems to have more continuity and more certainty than does the projection into the future. And people are aware of that. I mean, when they talk about the distant future, they use more abstract terms. When they talk about the past, they use concrete terms. But thinking of it as the problem that leaders have to confront is an interesting problem because they always, well, I won't say always, but they often have to figure out which of the potentials they want to pursue and which ones they won't pursue. And when they do that and pursue some alternatives, they change reality. <coughs> uh, and they change the way things unfold. And, and so how you conceptualize that, how you represent it uh, mathematically, uh, uh, how you use it to guide your leadership strategies is something that we're uh, thinking about. But that has to assume that the leader would be cognizant of those potentials. Uh, no, not really, because some of those potentials are enacted. They're just saying that the potentials are out there. They're like affordances, the way uh, Gibson talks about affordances. That, that the environment has affordances that are there. If people act in a certain way, it can support those affordances. So, and the notion of exploration versus exploitation that comes from uh, James March mm -hmm. uh, suggests that you learn about them by doing things. And when you do that, reality changes for you. So what does that say to people who are leaders? I mean, I, I understand that you put put this in a scholarly journal and it's mostly yeah, sure. part of a scholarly conversation, but um, how might that influence somebody who is a leader or somebody who's training to be a leader? Well, uh, I'll give you two more personal examples. One is, um, if you back up a step and you say, even before someone sees themselves as a leader or trains them, or is in training to be a leader, um, they have that potential. And they may not even realize that that potential is out there. They may be doing something that other people label as leaders. And I think I mentioned that example yesterday, uh, which comes from uh, Matt Alverson and some of his work. And so, uh, that potential's there, but it may not be till other people tell you uh, it, that you're a leader, that you recognize it, that that identity becomes one that you apply to yourself. And so then once that happens, I think you can uh, build skills and seek further leadership activities. But um, it's that initial creation of a self-view that's probably the seed from which leadership activity, leadership skills develop. Now, you could turn it around and say, okay, what does that mean for leaders? It means that they should be aware that there's all this potential in the people that they're working with. And what they do and how they label those individuals can affect the potential identities that they can develop and the way that they define reality and the way that they experience it for themselves and the trajectories that their lives go on. So it's a simple idea, but I think it has profound implications. Is this, are we gonna see more on quantum theory? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I hope so. Uh, to be honest, uh, I'm working with Suzanne Braun and we're trying to apply it to the notion of identity invention. And so the argument is that you have lots of identities, lots of things that you could be and could develop, and uh, they're out there as a potential, particularly in the distant future. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
in the distant future is probably more meaningful for somebody uh, who's younger, like Suzanne. Uh, she picked the first example. She said, you know, let's ask people about 40 years from now. I said, I don't want to answer questions about 40 years from now because I won't be here. Let's try 10, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but it, in so many ways it applies, you know? The world will be different. How will they fit in? Who will they be? Uh, and those are things that are out there. There's lots of possibilities, and people have to f repeatedly find the way that that they fit in that's meaningful for them. And, that, and, and when they do that and label themselves in a way, that would be what physicists might think of as a quantum collapse. And that's the way Henry uh, Sapp talks about it, and that's why yesterday when you asked me about books, I said read his book, his 2009 book. I'm sure that people are going to listen to this and not know what a quantum collapse is, so. Um. Well, quantum collapse is when, uh, it, in physics, it's what happens when you measure something. And uh, so then you, you find an electron's at a specific position and it has a specific velocity, although you can't measure both at the same time. Uh, and uh, it, it wasn't that way before he measured it. Right. And so the implication for leadership and social perceptions is when we go in and ask people about leadership, are we creating a phenomena for the perceiver that didn't exist before? That is the, the generalization of the issue that quantum physics dealt with in measurement 90 years ago to social perceptions in measurement. Are there ways that we could measure processes that don't put the words in somebody's mouth, literally, or the labels in their mind? Are there? Well, I think there, there are yeah. what we call implicit measures. Yeah. And uh, so you could use implicit measures. They're harder to use, harder to interpret, um, but they might be more useful. So we briefly yesterday talked about the Lieberhum Trust project that mm -hmm. you're working on, 2014-2017. Uh, uh, 99,833 pounds, a lot of money, in, 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 entitled the International Network of Implicit Leadership Theory. Um, could you briefly explain what you were doing there? I mean, the project is wrapped up, and I understand you've got continuing funding now yeah. to, keep, to keep the momentum, but um, just in general terms, I mean, what was the, the purpose of this? And you were the PI on this grant, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, the purpose was to bring people together so that they can have a more collaborative approach to doing leadership research and learn quicker about what other people are doing. You know, when you uh, read something in a journal article, it's kind of like three or four year lag in terms of history as to when they had an idea and did the research. Right. And so if, if you can bring people together and get them to communicate better, then you can reduce that time lag and help people as a group, do better science. So that's the basic idea. Uh, we have a good time too, and, and that's a spin-off. But that's one of the things that keeps one at the science, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I mean, we like what we're doing, we like each other, uh, and uh, sometimes uh, coordinating a meeting with you know, 15, 20 people from all over the world is a bit of a pain, but I have an administrative assistant who does most of that, so she does a really good job. So in, I understand that you've secured funding to expand this network that you've started. Not to expand it, but to continue it, uh -huh. uh, yeah, from the Army Research Institute. And what does one do for the Army Research Institute? The U.S. Army Research Institute. U.S. Army Institute. Research Institute. Well, we do research, okay. you know, and, uh, and part, just a small part of that is to meet and uh, discuss what we do, but we do research on implicit theories and trying to improve measurement and also 
looking at how leadership identities develop. Uh, it, it's a collaborative uh, uh, grant, so what it does is funds groups of projects that other people do. We're just kind of the conduit. And, but we do our own research, too. So I'm going to ask you some wrap-up questions, and I'll okay. respect your time and have you out of here probably yeah, sooner than we yeah, said. Yeah, exactly. That's okay. I have to give a talk at, at noon anyway. An so. so, and this is actually a question that one way or another, each one of the people that you suggested I talk to wanted me to ask you. And the question is, what keeps your intellectual fires burning? What, 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 what keeps you motivated to, to? That's a good question. Oh. I mean, the, the, I'm asking the motivation scholar what keeps him going, but. Um. Well, it's interesting. Uh, it's something I think I'm reasonably good at. Uh, um, my wife does it too, so uh, we both are happy spending a lot of time working, although uh, she's better at de developing other interests than me. She plays a cello now, so that takes some time. Uh, well, it, it's just, it's interesting. Uh, there's always new things that you can come across and uh, use it to gain some insight into issues that you didn't understand so well before. Like quantum theory. Quantum theory, or uh, uh, a guy by the name of Stanislav Dehaene has a theory of, it's called a, a global workspace theory, but consciousness is really a global workspace that allows us to integrate information from various parts of the brain and um, that's a quantum collapse. So it's in a microcosm uh, of what somebody like Henry Sapp uh, argues exists. So it's interesting. I still like to read stuff. Uh, uh, you know, you get older, your vision isn't as good. Uh, other uh, things don't yes. work as well. <laughs> but uh, I can still do it, so I'm, I'm happy to do it. <clears throat> what do you think most urgently needs to be done in the field? What, are, what is the field not looking at that it should be looking at? What, 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 what's out there that needs to be done? Well, that's a really tough question because, you know, people are doing such diverse things in the leadership area. Um, I think they need to have better measures, uh, more com comprehensive views as to what's going on. And I suppose, it's, now that I think about it, I'd say three things. Okay, better measures, that's number one. Uh, you need to do predictive studies rather than retrospective studies. And so by predictive, I mean where you manipulate something so you understand causality, you look at the consequences down the road. Mm -hmm. And um, you need to separate perceptions from performance. And uh, so that's three. And I, I don't know if I said this, but I think you need to move down to the event level in terms of understanding performance. Professionally, what are you most proud of? Oh, I'm most proud of my students. Personally, I'm most proud of my kids, you know? Yeah, I understand. <laughs> um, do you consider yourself to be a work in progress? I hope I'm still in progress. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, let me ask it a different way. What do you still, professionally, what do you still want to accomplish? Well, you know, that's a funny thing because uh, I haven't thought too much in terms of accomplishments. I just do things. In, uh, well, let's substitute do for accomplish. <clears throat> professionally, what do you still want to do? <clears throat> well, I'd like to, I'd like to have a better PhD program at Durham that uh, brings, so I think we've brought this, the leadership scholars there, but we don't have a good recruiting system to get the best students and support the best students. It's done differently in the UK than it is in the US, uh, at least where I was. So I'd like to see that change so that you can bring really good students together and really good scholars together and have them uh, 
be in an environment where they can be productive and it's sustainable. Um, personally, I'd like to see something happen to address global warming. I think that's the, the big leadership issue that uh, the world has not uh, dealt with and uh, will have to one way or the other. Or I should say climate change rather than global warming. Um, what would you like your legacy to be? Never thought about that, really. Uh, I suppose if you ask, the legacy is always in other people, the influence that you have on other people, because <laughs> they'll be here when you're not. And the surprising thing of, uh, in my career is a number of the students that I we work with are not here. You asked about mm -hmm. uh, Mike Rush, Jay Thomas, Karen Mayer, they've all passed on. Um, two more questions, and I'll let you go. You're giving a talk at noon, is that right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, is there anything that I should have asked you that I didn't? Uh, you should have asked me about uh, my personal life and family, and <laughs> which is, is, is also uh, yeah. so important and allows you to do the stuff that you do. And I've been married to uh, Rosalie Hall for almost 20 years now. And, uh, knew her as a colleague before then, so that's always been a really positive source of support and encouragement. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I have great, two great kids that I, uh, I'm really proud of, and they have good lives of their own, so uh, that was a challenge, but it's worked out okay. Raising children is a challenge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, is there anything that you want to say that I haven't given you a chance to say? No. Uh, um, it, well, I just thanks. You've been a, a great interviewer, a great listener. Uh, you obviously did your homework, and I appreciate. I always appreciate that, and uh, I'm happy to spend the time with you. Yeah, likewise. So while I've still got this on, I'll thank you on behalf of myself and the International Leadership Association and the Device Center. Okay.